It is 6.01, 6.02 p.m. Uh, I'm going to call this meeting to order. We have a quorum. Um, could you please, Rosa, make sure that we're recording the meeting? Here he is. Hey, Bernie, do you mind grabbing your nameplate to put it in front of where you're sitting? Just let me know when we're recording, Rosa. Okay, just can you confirm, are we recording? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so thanks everybody for coming tonight. We have a quorum, we're gonna start the meeting. The first item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. And I'm gonna throw a wrench in that and motion um, to actually amend the agenda um, to have item 6A moved up in front of item five, in the interest of ensuring that our staff, who are amazing, can um, present that tonight and go home at a reasonable hour. Um, do I have a second? Second. Second, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? Okay. Um, are we going to do a roll call for this or do we just vote? Okay. Um, I'll start with Bernie. Do you, did you second it? I did, yes. Okay. So, Anna, yes. 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 Uh, Jason? Yes. Yes. Bernie? Yes. Okay. So, we've, now change the agenda such that item 6A will be presented before the action item tonight. Um, so Ali, if you could please remind me that we did that, that would be awesome. Okay, um, the next item is future board items and tours. Uh, and I'll hand it over to staff for that. Good evening, members of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and community members who might be listening. I'm Allie Rode, the Director of Parks and Recreation. And during this portion of the meeting, we just provide some highlights on the upcoming agenda and other items that the board or community may find of interest. Um, the one I want to highlight, because we are in our summer travel and vacation season, is that tonight you're going to um, talk about the first draft of our Historic Places Plan, and you have that scheduled for action in July, and so just as a reminder, as Rosa sends out um, meeting details, if you would let us know planned attendance to make sure we have a quorum, that'll be critical, especially because we have an action item that we look forward to moving forward. Uh, the other thing I'll call out is that we have confirmed we are able to do a roving meeting or field trip for your August meeting. And so we'll be working with the chair and vice chair to schedule logistics for that and anticipate bringing you a brief item at your July meeting to get input on sites that will align with our capital improvement plan and where we would benefit from having an on-site um, conversation. And so we are working on keeping that meeting very light for you so that it can be site-based conversations about some of our upcoming capital projects. Other than that, I would just call your attention to everything in the department events and items of interest. There is a lot going on in our community this summer. The social streets experiment began yesterday with Roller Palooza on 13th Street. Um, I have two working legs today, so that's pretty exciting after uh, inline skating with my daughter. And with that, I just, I would encourage you to always look at this and know what's going on in the community, upcoming meetings. And as a reminder, this is also an opportunity if board members have items they would like discussed in the agenda, you could mention that for the chair and vice chair to bring to the agenda setting meeting that we're having tomorrow. Any discussion on this item? Okay, um, Allie, anything else? That's it on future items, thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, the next item on our agenda is public participation. And this portion of the meeting is for members of the public to communicate ideas or concerns to the board regarding parks and recreation issues for which a public hearing is not scheduled later in the meeting. Tonight there are um, not any public hearings scheduled. No, there are. Um, there are public hearings scheduled for later in the meeting, but I think that all of our commenters are for this initial public participation section, correct? 
That is our understanding. However, I will note that if any community member has joined us virtually and intends to speak at the public hearing, that is item 5A, I believe, um, that they should communicate. There is a form online, or you could put your name in the Zoom chat for our um, board secretary to pay attention to. I'm not in the Zoom, so I'm not sure if we have community members here for the public for the public meeting. Thank you, Allie. Uh, during this public participation time, the public is encouraged to comment on the need for parks and recreation programs and facilities as they perceive them. All speakers are limited to three minutes. Depending on the nature of your matter, you may or may not receive a response from the board after you deliver your comments. The board is always listening to and appreciative of community feedback. Secretary Rosa, will you please present the additional guidelines and then call on our first speaker tonight? And if you want me to read from the slide, I can do that. Just let me know. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and read from the slide on kind of decorum. The city is engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and council, and board members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up and speak in advance and use the name they are commonly known by. Individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is permitted online. You have three minutes for public comment. Vice Chair, who would you like to bring first? I get to pick. The first community member on the list yeah. is Marianne Briggs. Yeah, so let's, I'm gonna do this in the order in which they appear on my list. So let's call Marianne Briggs first. Hi, good evening. My name is Marianne Briggs and I've been a tennis player in Boulder for 50 years. From my first week in town in 1973, when I signed up for a tennis class at Centennial, what used to be junior high, to this very day, I've been involved with BTA, league tennis, many tournaments, including Austin Scott and the Boulder Open, and now just recreational tennis. I was also a health and physical education teacher at Fairview High School for a very long career, during which I enjoyed teaching tennis as one of many activities we offered. I do have some concerns, however, over the dwindling availability of courts. It seems like we are losing courts rather than gaining or even improving the ones we have. We've lost the 12 Kittredge courts, the four Williams Village courts, and possibly soon to lose the Rocky Mountain Tennis Center courts as well as the CU South courts. The ones we still have have seen better days and may have been lined with, many have been lined with pickleball lines, which prevents us from having league matches there. You may or may not know, but the Colorado Tennis Association does not allow official USTA and CTA matches to happen on courts that are lined with pickleball lines. Most of the rec center courts have been compromised also due to these lines, and it's very difficult to play a good game of tennis with so many extra lines on the court. The courts associated with Boulder Valley School District are often unavailable for much of the school year, so it's hard to get a court. The reservation system for tennis has gotten very difficult as well with pickleball blocking out certain times and days. I'm curious why the pocket park courts like Martin Park and Columbine, which by the way, look great. Thank you for resurfacing them. Why they weren't the ones that were allowed to be lined with pickleball lines because a facility having four or five tennis courts like the rec center courts is appropriate for league tennis as long as they aren't lined with pickleball lines. Whereas the parks with only two courts 
cannot accommodate the three to five matches required by a league match. So bottom line is we need more courts, but at the very least, we need to maintain the ones we have. We need to avoid lining them with pickleball lines, and we need to keep the reservation system open to all types of players. Also, with fewer available courts, the general public, family and children, families and children, have a more difficult time finding an open court. These folks are probably not going to be waiting on a computer exactly a week ahead to reserve a court. So there needs to be the opportunity to spontaneously show up at a court in the city of Boulder and be able to play some fun tennis with family or friends. I personally have never been a member of a tennis club and have not had the opportunity to play indoors throughout the year. So in my dreams, I envision a beautiful public facility with indoor courts as well as outdoor courts like the Apex Center in Jefferson County. Why can't Boulder do that? Thank you. Thanks so much, Marianne. Uh, next we have Mac, Matt Rictel. Rosa, do we have Matt? Matt, go ahead and I'll time you via my phone. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, tennis I can play, technology clearly evades me. I apologize. Um, all right. Um, listen, I, I grew up in, first of all, many thanks for having me. I grew up in Boulder and uh, I thank Ms. Briggs for her comments because I, I want to echo some of them. When I grew up here as a kid, tennis was a thing for more affluent kids who could belong to places with courts, particularly in winter. Um, and now I'm a dad with teens who play tennis and I play myself and things have changed over the years here and elsewhere. And humbly, but with urgency, I just want to ask, this community not to go backwards and not to return tennis to a thing for those, while I love them, uh, but I do not belong to Meadows and Boulder Country Club where the wait is years and there is exclusivity. This will be all but the certain thing in winter if we uh, do not act to, to um, create a facility. With this preface, I'll make just three very quick points. One, to echo Ms. Briggs, this is about family members and members of all ages, kids, and parents love to play um, in winter and summer. We need, we need facilities for that. Um, there are so many people, I am aging myself, 60s and 70s and 80s who find recreation and fitness. Two, community members across the country have found a way to accommodate tennis, even ones more land starved than Boulder. Uh, San Francisco to wit has a recent opening of a wonderful facility that allows year round play. Um, and finally, and this is the most important point I'll make tonight, please, please, please do not engage in magical thinking. This is happening, the closure of courts, it's happening imminently. For months, I and others have been in conversation with Ms. Rhodes. Thank you, Allie. Um, we appreciate being listened to. And I guess what I wanna to urge tonight is please hear us as well, not just listen to us. This is happening in absent action. Tennis is going to return to the thing only for those who belong to the exclusive clubs. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Matt. Next we have Dewi Wynn. Okay, um, I can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Can hear okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and start. I don't see a timer. Uh, my name is Dewi Wynn. My husband, Brad Higus, and I moved to Boulder from Massachusetts two years ago. Um, our small town of 23,000 had 11 good quality public tennis courts at the high school, junior high, and at a public park. 
even, the, even though the courts were well used, reservations were not required. You could usually jump on without waiting. Competition with pickleball was not an issue then, but it may be now. There were also many private tennis clubs with indoor courts in our town and neighboring towns. Of course, we had to pay high hourly rates. When we first moved here to Boulder, we were excited to be able to play tennis at the South Boulder Rec Center with an easy walking distance to our house. We rarely made reservations, but sometimes did for a nominal fee. The courts seemed well used at various hours by recreational tennis players, um, such as ourselves and others. My husband and I play on several USTA teams for mixed doubles and men's and women's doubles. We love the model of the tennis association, making use of public courts and not forcing us to pay costly hourly fees for courts and lessons with pros. However, due to inadequate and unavailable courts, we have been forced to join associations in neighboring towns, such as Longmont and Louisville. Combined, we play Boston, uh, excuse me, Boulder Tennis Association, CVTA, and LTA, uh, Longmont Tennis Association. Playing out of town is especially disappointing since we have public courts near our house in Table Mesa. The Fairview High School ones and the Sobo Rec Center courts are within easy walking distance. The high school courts have big cracks. The Sobo Rec Center courts have been taken over by pickleball with little opportunity for drop-in at regular times, as others have mentioned. Um, also, as Marianne mentioned, because of the pickleball lines, we can only play BTA league matches at Centennial or CU South. My hope is that there would be more public courts available for tennis in South Boulder and other parts of Boulder. We would love to investigate whether the Fairview High School courts could be repaired or the Sobo or CU South courts could be made more available to the public. We do occasionally play at East, Martin, and Centennial, but it would be nice if we could play cl closer to home. Tennis has been a great lifelong sport for us, and we would love the next generation to enjoy the sport easily and at a low cost. Court availability and quality would certainly contribute toward that end. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much. Uh, and Rosa, before we call the next speaker, do we have the timer so that the speakers can see? Thank you. Um, next up is Leonard Siegel. Good evening, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, hi. Um, yes, I'm uh, Leonard Siegel. I'm an architect by training and the executive director of the preservation organization, Historic Boulder Inc. And I wanna bring to your attention three topics of relevance to your scope a review this evening. The first is a historic places plan. Uh, historic Boulder has appreciated being included as an expert stakeholder at several informational meetings during the research phase of this project. Some of our members have contributed many hours of time to review the text of the HIP and have offered corrections to make the report as accurate as possible to comply with state historic fund grant stipulations. Since we received the new HIP report this past Friday, several of our expert volunteers reviewed the new documents in the very short period of time over the weekend. Regarding the Columbia Cemetery, we have found some inaccuracies still and whole items of historical importance left out of the text. Also, there does not seem to be much in the way of recommendations for maintenance and protection of historic features like grave markers. I'm happy to email the details of the corrections that would improve the HIP report but can we have a little bit more time for review? It was our understanding that the Huntington Banshell in Central Park was a part of the HIP, but it doesn't show up in the documents sent out this past Friday. So uh, the question is, is it in or is it out? The second topic I wanted to speak about is the proposed Civic Park Historic District. In, on July 12th, the City Preservation Landmarks Board will have a public hearing about the district application. As you know, Central Park was designed by the most famous landscape and planning company ever in the history of America, the firm of Frederick Law Olmsted and Sons. It is one of the very few parks by the Olmsteads that is west of the Mississippi. Others include Yosemite Park, Berkeley, and the Stanford University campuses. Historic preservation is certainly warranted for this treasured property in the heart of Boulder. Be assured that a historic district does allow selective changes over time. 
Its creation will also provide the opportunity to begin to rebrand the neighborhood as an attractive community asset. And the third topic, just really quickly, is the cultural landscape assessment that's being promoted by the Parks and Recreation staff. Historic Boulder appreciates that the staff is interested in the history of Central Park. I can assure you that this area is one of the most heavily researched parts of Boulder because of the many landmark approval processes for all the properties in and around the park. In the opinion of Historic Boulder, there is no reason that the CLA should hold up the landmark district designation process. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Leonard. And then finally, we have Greg Mianski. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And if we could get a timer for Greg to look at so he knows. Thank you so much, Rosa. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. All right. Uh, good evening, members of the Boulder Parks and Rec Advisory Board. My name is Greg Mianski, and I'm here today to advocate for developing a new multi-court indoor and outdoor tennis facility. I myself am an avid tennis player and former coach for Gonzo Tennis. As we all know, the city of Boulder itself already has a very limited number of public courts and or affordable private facilities. With the impending development of CU South and Rocky Mountain Tennis Club, the city of Boulder stands to lose over 25 courts in the next few years. I believe that in addition to losing the courts, we stand to lose what is a very vibrant tennis community. Adequate court space for teaching programs is essential to the growth and development of players at all skill levels. As a city, we must provide accessible and well-maintained courts to allow as many people as possible to learn and enjoy the sport. This should not be a sport for the elite or for those that can afford to pay daily court fees. I can also help but include a word about the needs of the wheelchair tennis community. Accessible courts and robust programs like the ones at RNPC currently offer, <coughs> or sorry, excuse me, currently offer individuals with disabilities the chance to engage in physical activity, develop skills, and build a strong sense of community. By building a wheelchair player friendly facility, we can create an inclusive community that embraces diversity and promotes the values of equal opportunity and accessibility. On top of that, a new facility would also benefit CU women's tennis. With the loss of existing courts, providing a suitable space for collegiate athletes to practice and compete is critical. By offering a state-of-the-art facility, we can support the growth and success of CU tennis while building a stronger connection between the university and the tennis community. And then lastly, there are the recreational players, the folks like myself. We too require ample court space to enjoy our favorite sport. By providing a central hub with multiple indoor and outdoor courts, we can ensure that recreational players have access to quality facilities throughout the year. This will help promote a healthy and active lifestyle among our residents and create a welcoming environment for players of all ages and skill levels. In conclusion, constructing a new multi-core facility here in Boulder is a no-brainer. Investing in such a project would secure a central tennis hub in Boulder and the, Grady, the greater Rocky Mountain region, ensuring that our community continues to thrive and enjoy the benefits of this fantastic sport. Thank you. Uh, Rosa, do we have any additional speakers who have signed up after the deadline? Okay, thank you. Um, thanks to everybody who called in with comments. We hear you and appreciate your comments. Uh, since there are no other community members who would like to speak tonight, I'll now close the public participation section of this meeting. Would any members of the PRAB like to comment or question any of the public comments? Jason? Um, yeah, thanks to everyone who, who called in and, uh, for those comments. Um, I know we talked about this a little bit uh, last meeting, Tina, when you presented on the kind of status of the courts, um, you know, clearly there's a there's an interest and a, a need, a demand for indoor tennis. And so it seems like two things, I would, you know, we should probably, um, in any kind of rethinking of a rec center, that should probably be part of that conversation about what that looks like. I have no idea what this costs, but, 
you know, uh, that there's, there's clearly demand there. And obviously if with the loss of all the current, you know, indoor places to play. Um, and secondly, again, I don't have any sense of the cost here, um, but it seems like there maybe would be an opportunity for some kind of partnership with um, you know, the university, with the school district uh, to, to tent current, you know, current outdoor facilities to allow indoor use and you know, possibly recoup some of the funds through, you know, some kind of entrance fee. It just seems like there's, you know, I'd love to know what that looks like, what that costs, um, you know, if that's even an option, have some of these partnerships been explored. Um, you know, this is like, this is obviously multiple meetings where we've heard from the public about the need for, you know, more indoor space, obviously more courts generally, but I think the um, one of the messages loud and clear is like, you know, that we really don't have any spot places to play year round. Um, so to, in, I don't have anything else, you know, I don't have any ideas, just more like let's, you know, might be worth exploring and maybe coming back to this at a future meeting. Um, I'll give you a chance to address that if you want to in your general update, but do you want to address his point now or do you want me to ask the, if there are any other comments from the board? I can answer some of that. So just about everything that you you mentioned there in that court system plan is part of that um, <clears throat> that outline and that scope. So um, we can kind of go back to that again and look at in this um, court system plan, what we're looking at is exploring alternatives. So um, the outcomes of this plan will even start to look at locations and alternatives and indoor and outdoor. And then we're kind of thinking about it in the terms of as you've seen a million times, the fiscally constrained action and vision, right? What can we do to take care of what we have? What can we do with the money we have in that fiscally constrained? What can we do in that action with um, partnerships or different additional funding? And then the vision generally kind of goes into that, that sort of larger vision, um, those larger types of partnerships. Um, also included in that would be identifying potential future partnerships. And it will be looking at things like, um, if there was an indoor facility or potentially something like the bubble that is currently at Rocky Mountain Tennis, like what does that look like? And does that make sense for us? Any other members of the board? Bernie? Uh, just a related question. Sorry, that's very loud. Um, I noticed that the, the budget line item for the court pr program increased substantially. Uh, I, know, I know this was probably discussed last week that I was, or last month when I wasn't here, but could you just Tell us a little bit about what the additional budget will be used for. So what we had been looking at previously was about $60,000 per year. That was bumped up in the, um, in the early years to do some resurfacing of courts. And then as you get further out is um, actually replacing the tennis courts with post intention, which has a longer lifespan. Um, and then there's also the addition of some pickleball courts at East Boulder. So you'll look at that. And so it bumps up exponentially by the few out years. And then the court system plan will really direct what that future and what that what we include in the capital improvement strategy moving forward is. Any additional questions or comments? Anna? Thanks, I just had a question. Um, I'm hearing a lot of people who, in the public comment that are saying like, it's not enough, it's not enough. So I was just wondering if there's any kind of benchmarking that's been done to determine what is a reasonable amount of courts per capita in a similar town yeah. to Boulder. So there is a benchmark study that was done um, for the last master plan um, that shows per capita against um, similar cities. Um, I think when we did that though, the two things that have arisen are the um, explosion of pickleball in the community. So then having to share those courts. Um, and then in addition to that, our communities really feeling the heat from several other private courts that are coming out of the system. Um, they were private courts, but could be reserved or used publicly. Um, so they're feeling that stress on both sides. But where did Boulder stand with respect to the other cities? Um, if I recall, we're right at or even above the benchmark per capita. And I guess since I am unmuted, I'm just going to add that all of these are exactly the questions that we'll be exploring through the court system plan. And I'd love to speak to the community members listening. We thank you for joining us on your Monday evening. And I just want to call out, I, I hear folks saying, you know, that maybe they, they don't feel heard because we don't have shovels in the ground right now on tennis courts, but we do serve a community of 106,000 people and anything we build monies we spend, we have to be very thoughtful and make sure we're doing it for the whole community. 
But um, for both tennis and pickleball, I'm excited about the work ahead. We've allocated staff resources. We've allocated dollars for this work. And by the end of the year, we'll be looking at final recommendations for a court system plan. One other thing I'll just add for community members listening, if you want to stay up to date on that plan, including as there's progress and opportunities for input, if you just Google um, Boulder Parks and Recreation Racket Sports, there's a feedback page where if you give us some feedback, we'll capture that email and add it to the email list for this project. Thanks, Allie. Anything else you want to add? I think we hit it all. Okay, great. Um, okay, so that concludes the public participation portion of the meeting. The next agenda item is approval of the consent agenda. And I just wanna remind the board that approving the consent agenda includes the minutes from the past meeting and the design construction updates and the operations updates in one fell swoop. So if you have any comments or questions about um, or proposed amendments, any of those things, um, now is the time. Any questions on the planning design and construction updates or operations updates? Um, hearing none, I will just add that uh, from our absent and esteemed chair, Chuck Brock, he wrote some comments that he wanted me to pass on that uh, congratulations on the groundbreaking for the golf facility, exclamation point. Um, and thanks to me and Jason for representing the PRAB at the ceremony. And I'll just say that um, I had the chance to attend the groundbreaking uh, of the new golf facility. It looks fantastic. And uh, there was a lot of buzz um, at the event about this facility, and it's going to be so great. And it was great to get community members, engage with community members and city leaders at that groundbreaking. And it was awesome to be able to um, hold a shovel in my hand and pose for that picture. So thank you. <laughs> I know Jason agrees with me on that. <laughs> um, any other comments on the consent agenda? Yes. Uh, just quickly, I noticed that my name was penciled in as a liaison to the uh, Recreation Center Exploration. I'm, I'll just say on the record, I'm very glad to help out in that way. Okay. Are you asking for an amendment to any of the minutes? Uh, well, the minutes say, ask Bernie. Um, so consider me asked and uh, okay. I'm getting an answer. Okay. Um, so with that amendment, can we um, get a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'm sorry, I've got a quick question on that. Since Bernie raised it, uh, are, we're going to go back to that list again another time, right? So That's, I was noting, it's actually an item under the matters from the board tonight. So you'll be able to discuss right. the list. Yep. So we got names thrown out and penciled in and it's an item for you all to explore later under matters from the board. Okay, so I'll second it then while I have the mic. Okay. Um, so take a motion. I'm right. taking a motion. So you're the motion. Okay. A second. Anybody want a second? I'll second. Thank you, Anna. Any discussion? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll just go from this side, Jason. Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Sunny. Yes. Bernie. Yes. Anna. Yes. And yes, so the consent agenda is approved with that amendment, I guess, <laughs> to the minutes. Um, the next item on the agenda is, on the new agenda, is item 6A, which has been moved up in front of action item. So that's now item five. And that is about the historic places plan final draft. Thank you so much. So this item is going to be presented by uh, senior landscape architect Tina Briggs. And I just want to call out a theme here, court system plan, flat irons, golf course, historic places. Um, Tima is bearing an incredible workload on our team. And we're so grateful to have her because she's doing really great work on some really important projects. So um, Tina is going to be joined. I just want to personally thank that Mercy Gerwing is here. She is a principal planner with the planning and development services department and the city's real lead and expert on historic preservation. So we're really grateful here. She's going to speak to some of the topics. I know you guys have a plan for how we're going to do that. And it'll also speak to some of the comments that um, Mr. Um, Siegel shared during public comment. So with that, I'll hand it to Tina. Yeah, Rosa, can you make me an admin so I can share my screen?
and then Christopher should also be online if we can. While they're getting organized, I'll also just thank KJ for being here. Christopher Johnson is the um, Senior Comprehensive Planning Manager with Planning Development Services, um, part of the long-term planning and historic preservation team as well. And so having their expertise here, we really appreciate yeah, as there's um, conversation about a historic district, we've got the experts in the room, both um, in person and virtually. So we really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, the Zoom link. Uh, the one you sent to me, I think it was Wednesday. Is there a different one you'd like me to use? You mean the power presentation? Yeah. I don't have my email open. It's taking a minute. It actually is in the prab folder if it would be easier to grab from there. And I'll start out while we're talking today. So the the um the Presentation is going to be about the historic places plan. Um, however, there are two kind of adjacent projects that are happening um, on one of the properties. And so we're gonna change the order a little bit because in the memo, they were attachments, um, but because we have the folks from uh, Planning and Development Services here um, to run through what that historic district process looks like. We'll touch on that first, then we'll touch a little bit on the cultural landscape assessment, and then we'll just jump right into the hip. I just emailed it to your email, Rosa. That's it. Okay, let's move it there. Is Christopher also on there as a presenter? Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so we'll just... If you can hear me, I, I am here. I am a real person for sure, but I'm not, I'm not able to share my video, so I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Um, why don't we go to the next slide and I'll just kind of, t I just talked about the agenda a little bit here. Um, let's see. Um, right, so the adjacent pro projects that we're talking about, and then we'll do the project overview of the HIP, just to remind us what the purpose is, um, and then looking at the process and outreach and how we got to where we are today. And then you'll see that chapter content, like the three big building blocks of this project were the history historic context, the condition assessment, and then the recommended actions. When we talked to you in February, <laughs> we did an outline um, of the historic context and condition assessment and shared that information with you then. So we aren't gonna go through that again. You certainly have access to it via the project page. If you wanna go through and look at that, you're welcome to. We'll focus on the recommended actions tonight and explain kind of what those are and how those will affect um, our system. So, um, with that, I'm going to give it over to Christopher, who's going to talk a little bit about the Civic Area Historic District application that was submitted. Um, and before, I know you guys have heard a little bit about that in the past, so I won't go into too, too much detail. Um, but Christopher, if you want to introduce yourself and take it over. Great. Thank you, Tina. And thank you, Allie, for that introduction earlier. Um, as Allie mentioned, my name is Christopher Johnson. I'm the Comprehensive Planning Manager. So oversee uh, within planning and development services our, our long range land use plan planning. So um, the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan is really the, the focus of a lot of our work, but the historic preservation program is also part of our um, part of our comprehensive planning team. And uh, so Marcy Gerwing is there. She is the lead historic preservation planner, uh, principal within our, within our division. Uh, and so both of us will be available to answer questions um, that you may have, but I've got just a couple of slides to walk through quickly to give you an update uh, on an application that was referenced uh, earlier. And also just so you can really understand the process that is out before us. Um, as Tina mentioned, you may have heard about some of this uh, in the past. And if you remember back to about the middle of last year, 
Uh, there was originally a, a application to expand the um, the boundary of individual landmark uh, of the Glen Huntington band shell. And as part of that process, ultimately went to city council and the staff recommendation was not to expand that boundary uh, in lieu of a more comprehensive and uh, intentional uh, you know, research into and exploring of a historic district, as opposed to just addressing that one particular individual landmark uh, by itself. So we have been working with parks and recreation staff uh, through the beginning of this year to develop uh, really a strategy for that and what that looks like. And, and Tina will uh, speak to you about that cultural landscape assessment, which is ultimately what we have landed on. Uh, the groups and the individuals that were interested in that uh, band shell expansion originally, and then also very much advocating for this historic district uh, they have the ability to submit an application on their own, and that is what uh, has, has occurred. And so we received a complete application from them uh, on May 30th, uh, so about a month ago, and have reviewed that. And it's, uh, it is uh, going then to the Landmarks Board for what's called an initiation hearing on July 12th. Uh, that vote uh, and that meeting is really uh, the board's opportunity to vote whether or not to accept that application at this time. Uh, if it is accepted, then we have quite a bit of work to do in front of us uh, as staff, and we there's a, a window of time that is in the Boulder Revised Code that defines this process. And we have about four months to complete a number of different uh, activities. So ultimately, we would meet with the property owners, which, of course, in this case is the city of Boulder uh, and the various departments that are represented within this entire civic area. So obviously it includes the Parks and Recreation Department, but also facilities and several other departments as well. Uh, there would be a need for some continued involvement and coordination among the Landmarks Board, this group as well, and City Council to make sure that they are up to date uh, and informed of the process. We would have to develop and draft some design guidelines as part of this process as well that would ultimately uh, apply to a future historic district if it was applied. And then there would be more broad community outreach uh, through the end of the summer and the early part of the fall. So, Ultimately, that would all land uh, and go towards a recommendation or a designation hearing with the Landmarks Board, and then also historic districts are reviewed by Planning Board for any land use implications, and then ultimately move to City Council. So based on our schedule, we're uh, and looking at a, really a realistic timeline of approximately six to eight months to ultimately reach uh, the decision point of city council who would have the authority to designate or not designate the historic district uh, sometime in that early part of 2024. You go to the next slide, Rosa. This is just kind of a visual layout of that same process that I just described. And I, I wanna highlight two uh, important touch points. So in the green on the left-hand side, you can see that during the four month process uh, that would occur between that Landmarks Board initiation hearing and then ultimately a designation hearing, um, we would wanna touch base and really engage the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board at two key milestones. So. If that initiation or if the uh, application is accepted by the Landmarks Board, uh, then we would want to come back to you and really give you a, a more in-depth overview of the application, of the history of the area, uh, and importantly, what, what does designation mean, uh, for example. So there are some uh, departments uh, that uh, historic designation may already apply to landmark structures. And so, you know, the application of a district really wouldn't have too much of an effect, but because the district would also apply to those areas between the existing landmark structures, um, that certainly would be within the purview of, of this board and of this department. So we would want to explain really what that means for future changes going forward. Uh, the second point, of course, would be as we are developing those draft design guidelines. So we would uh, want to have input from uh, from this board and also the Landmarks Board. You know, we haven't figured a lot of this out in detail, but we would anticipate possibly a joint meeting to where those draft design guidelines could be reviewed and discussed. 
Um, but again, it, this is all, uh, I would say this is all uh, contingent upon the Landmarks Board accepting that application on July 12th. Next slide, please. So this is the boundary uh, that is proposed within the application. You can see there that it includes the Penfield Tate Municipal Building where you are this evening. Generally follows the creek uh, down to the, to the east and to the south to Arapahoe, comes up 13th Street and then over to uh, 14th and back along Canyon. So it includes Central Park itself, the five individual uh, designated landmarks that already exist, which are the, the municipal building, the band shell, the atrium building, uh, the uh, Bimoka building, and the Duchambe Tea House, uh, and then also would include portions of Broadway and 13th Street, the plaza, that space that is between the atrium and the tea house, and then also includes the parking lots behind those buildings. Next slide. And really that's kind of the overview and description of the application that's been received. So the uh, Marcy and the rest of the historic preservation staff are working very diligently on the memo and materials that will be um, available at this link here and also on the Landmark Board website, uh, I believe a week prior to the meeting. Uh, so that's coming up fairly quickly. And certainly we are here to answer questions this evening. And also Marcy and I will be uh, available down the road as well. If you have any questions, you are more than welcome to reach out directly. The microphone there doesn't work. Oh, the light is green. Yeah, no, I think it does. It's there that you, you can't, there's no camera there and you can't present from there. Okay, I will also be a disembodied voice this evening, <laughs> <laughs> except for you all. Um, thank you, KJ, for that overview. I just also wanted to introduce myself, Marcy Gerwing, um, Principal Historic Preservation Planner. And um, the purpose of tonight is really to let you all know that an application has been submitted. And um, the, Jan the July 12th, uh, Landmarks Board hearing will be kind of a decision point whether or not they accept the application that kicks off this six to eight month process, or if they choose not to. Um, but we wanted to get ahead of that, let you all know that we're thinking ahead, that we want you all to be involved in this process. Um, and then also just to answer any general questions that you have, but know that there's plenty of time um, in the code process uh, for us to connect. Thank you. If you want to go to the next, well, we are there any questions quick before we jump in? Okay. Um, I, I, I do, I want to recommend we pause there if there are, because I've heard questions, if there are questions about what the historic district application means or the process, is it, does it work, Tina, if we pause there and make sure we get questions out about what it means in the process? Yeah, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the board? Jason? I just had a question. It sounds like all the structures are already designated, the municipal building, the tea house. Um, and then when we dealt with this issue earlier, when it was just the band shell area, there was a, there was a level of protection already. So what, what um, you know, and then they, someone mentioned that this is kind of the, uh, the board wanted them to go back and have a more comprehensive um, proposal. So, so it sounds like this is really just the kind of the streets, the connecting area, some of the other, like what is what is not currently protected, I guess. Oh, sure. Would you mind going back to the diagram there? There we go. Okay, so the proposed boundary is Central Park. And so, as you mentioned, um, part of Central Park is currently designated as, as part of the Banshell site. And then um, it would extend south all the way to Arapahoe, and then would include the already designated uh, Muni building, Atrium Tea House, and Bimoka building. And then the, di the district's also proposed to include 13th Street, Broadway, the 13th Street Plaza, and then the parking lots behind those buildings and along 14th. That's kind of the area in between those five landmarks. And then just kind of, you know, I guess related, like what, what does, I mean, I understand historic preservation designation, but when it's, when it's land and streets, like what is that, what, kind of how does that what does that prevent or what does it not allow um what what is the you know, i understand the kind of the vision here and having a comprehensive area but um 
you know, what, what is, I guess, what's the point of the, the larger designation versus kind of individual or the smaller ones? Great question. And I think the biggest difference between individual landmark designation and a historic district is the ability to create design guidelines that's specific to this unique area. And so um, a couple examples of already designated uh, park managed areas of the Pearl Street Mall. So looking at changes within their Columbia Cemetery and Chautauqua, of course. Um, we review about 200 applications a year. So I would say preservation has a you know, reputation of everything's kind of cast in amber and, and nothing changes. But our whole pro program is about reviewing changes and it's about how it changes. Um, I will say of all the um, landmark sites, there's so much change on Pearl Street with the different um, businesses going in and out. Um, but I would say in general, parks are very stable areas. Though they change, they evolve, they um, kind of reflect the current, uh, I don't know, ways we recreate. Um, but compared to the rate of change across the city, I would say parks tend to be more stable. Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Are there any other questions, comments from the board? Anna? What limitations would a um, historic district parking lot have on it that would be different from a regular parking lot in Boulder? Great question. So um, in a historic district, there are typically um, features or structures that contribute and those that are considered non-contributing. And contributing ones are held to maybe a higher standard non-contributing, it's more about how do the changes there impact the contributing items. Um, and so for a parking lot, um, we don't have many vacant lots downtown, but it would be looked at as infill of if that were to be developed, how, what's the form, the shape, the materials, how does that relate to the character of the historic district? Um, so it does have a layer of review in terms of how it changes. If it stayed a parking lot, sorry to interrupt. If it stayed a parking lot, I don't anticipate there would be a whole lot of uh, review for that. It's more looking farther down the line of if buildings were uh, proposed to be there. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments from the board? I just wanna, um, <clears throat> so thank you for your presentation, but also I just wanna firm up kind of the timeline and the PRABS role um, so maybe you can help me with that, just to make sure the public understands what we have to do with this. Mm -hmm. um, so from what I understand is there's been an application submitted and the planning board in July is going to vote on whether to accept the application. Is that right? Uh, the Landmarks Board. The Landmarks Board. Mm -hmm. My apologies. And then in July, the Landmarks Board decides whether it's accepted, not approved, right? Correct. Okay. And the approval is... So the acceptance of the application then kicks off like a eight month process where there's more community input, right? Yes. Um, Rosa, would you mind going back one more slide? Yes, thank you. Um, so the code uh, specifies a pretty uh, structured process, I would say, in terms of the community engagement. It, it's written more for property owners in mind, but um, to go through the community engagement and then the review process. So the landmarks designation hearing on the 12th is whether this process starts or not. Mm -hmm. And so um, between, I think that's July to October or November, is this pretty intensive uh, period where we would meet with the department reps and then would meet with you all. And what we um, have proposed and are thinking of coming back to you all um, to do a presentation, here's an overview of the history, here's what historic designation would mean to you all and uh, to this site. And then uh, look to have a joint uh, landmarks board and CRAB joint study session to look at design guidelines and help shape those um, before it then goes to the landmarks board for a designation hearing where they make a recommendation to council. And then we go to planning board for their recommendation about the land use implications. Okay, so finally to council. Okay, thank you. And then so just so I'm clear, there's gonna be 
you're anticipating there might be a joint session or a, a study session between this board and the landmarks board? That's what we're thinking. We're open to your thoughts if you feel that would be helpful, but it, the intent there is to have you all involved and to um, meet together with the landmarks board as it's the two boards are, I think, the most involved in, in this uh, project. Right. And then we advise on this um, and provide our input, but the landmarks board actually presents an action to send this to council for approval, correct? Correct. Okay, so we don't actually approve anything. Right. Okay. It'd be more advisory. Okay, and you anticipate that, that our role would be like in the form of that special meeting that would be in the fall? Correct. Okay. Um, yes, October, November is when we're looking for the landmark designation hearing. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other questions off of my questions? Okay, thanks. Okay, so to further complicate this, <laughs> um, what we are doing um, when we talk about the cultural landscape assessment, this kind of dialed way back when we first started talking about um, des historically designating park property, which is slightly different than what you would think of as a structure, for example. And so um, we looked at the National Park Service guidelines of what it would look like um, to designate a park space. And we're setting a precedence here of thinking in the future of when we talk about designating a park property, um, how do we actually evaluate that and what are the criteria? So that's where the cultural landscape assessment comes in. It was attached an attachment um, in the memo, which shows that it's a much smaller area. So the historic district, right, is covering the application as submitted. However, we've started the process to really look at just the park area in particular, since that the, that's what we have the most purview over, and looking at um, what if it is if it's significant, and what is significant about it, and what are the right periods to be looking at for that. So, what we're hoping to do is have this completed in September. It's more of a research document, and making sure that you have the right information and solid information to help in that decision making and making res recommendations in the future. Um, so really just, again, the area's history, the main periods of development, um, and then the existing features that have integrity. Um, so before I go too far on that, um, do we have any questions on the landscape assessment? I have one question. I think this came up in the public comment where the, the comment was that this was, uh, and I don't know, if, I think it was that this is an unnecessary step that it provided another layer. It sounds like it's going to be done in September, so it's not that time can, you know, won't delay two things too much. But what is the response to that kind of issue of whether this is an unnecessary step? I don't, I'm more just repeating the comment than. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, no, I, I yeah, I mean, what we're talking about too is right. Um, it's something commonly in Boulder, we haven't designated a lot of park spaces. So what does the actual process look like? So it's kind of setting that precedent moving forward. If we're going to look at another park space, what is the actual assessment? And then I think we have a lot of different like parts of the documentation. Um, and that started to get to put together for the historic places plan. However, the historic places plan is only looking at the designation boundary in. This is actually kind of adding information to that boundary out to all of Central Park. So we have all the information to share with you. So for example, right now, if I asked you if Central Park sh should be designated based on what criteria, we wanna lay that out for you just to help look at it and see what that picture is. And I just want to add one other clarifying comment. Thanks to again to folks. I want the the application was received by community groups with their proposed boundary. Part of the process is is there historic in, uh, is there historic relevance? Is it intact? Is there integrity to the site? And then what is the appropriate boundary? So all of that is part of the conversation and the process. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Rosa, will you hit the next slide, please? Okay, so just going back to the HIP purpose, I think this touches on a little bit of the, the comment as well. So um, in this document, again, it's the, the properties that are currently historically designated with their current boundaries. 
Um, so we wanted each property documented well and at the same level. So we know we have so many stories about some properties and a lot less information about others. And we really wanted to kind of focus on the hardcore facts. So when we look at historic context, um, we're really looking at the facts. And so you're not going to see a full history of all the pro the properties. So if it feels like something's maybe missing, um, it is in draft form. I'd love to address anything that's missing, but it is intentionally kind of set to be a very specific um, set of like uh, guidelines and what the history looks like. And what this document was really meant to do is for that proactive planning. For our historic and cultural assets, we've been very reactive in the past. This is really the opportunity to change that into a proactive um, planning process. So when you look at that, another thing that Lynn had mentioned is that he doesn't see maintenance pieces in there. This isn't intended to keep the maintenance. Um, what we're looking at is future capital improvement plans. So what we want to look at is when we're looking at 24 to 29 capital improvement strategy, we have the big items that we can take, look at together. So even when you look at each property, we have priorities. Then when you look at all of the historic and cultural assets, we have to prioritize within that. And then that has to fit into the greater system as well. So um, we focus basically um, on taking care of what we have. And that really is based upon even that is a five to 10 year plan to really even get close to um, hitting the priorities that we have on just the capital maintenance, not maintenance, but the capital projects of um, rehabilitation. And then there are a few pieces on there where we would love to um, have this documentation. It's set in stone. It's something we can share. So for communication, education, even when volunteers are asking for information, we're giving everyone the exact same information. <coughs> Excuse me. And then it's also that document as other planners um, are looking at the system that they might be doing something adjacent to our properties, that they actually have something to look at as well that includes some treatment recommendations and things that they should consider. Next slide, please. This is just a quick overview of the timeline. Um, you can see, it, see it's been a multi-year process. Um, and really the sort of the top green section is really the process itself. The red section is the touch points that we've had. One is public with several public meetings and outreach, and then the stakeholders touch points with each of the properties with them as well. Um, as you may know, when you're doing um, research on historic properties, you could keep going forever and digging deeper. At, at one point, we do kind of need to put the pencil down. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. <laughs> and then you can see in the blue, the touch points that we've had with Pratt and Lance Marcus Board as well. We're nearing the end. So what we're looking at is the draft. We brought you the draft in pieces because it is a 400 page document. That's a bit overwhelming. Um, so we had touched on the meat before and we'll just kind of review the priorities tonight. <laughs> Next slide. Um, again, right, this just shows us what was in the historic context was the overview and the boundaries, the history, the significance. And then we did the condition assessments. So we really had to look at the conditions, the structural integrity, um, architectural and historic, and then what are the current issues. And all of that bundled together helped us develop the treatment guidance with that focus on preservation and rehabilitation. And then really just the future capital investment guidance. What you won't see again in here is things that we kind of hope and dream for in the future. So not that this document in any way, shape or form will like will prevent um, those opportunities. But any future opportunities that would enhance the properties would likely come within a project, um, like you would see, um, for example, with the civic area. Um, some of the things that we looked at in this document will be looked at and considered as they're developing those plans. All right, next slide. So <clears throat> taking the condition assessments um, and the historic context, these are the priorities we used, or the, sorry, the criteria we use to develop those priorities. So first and foremost is impact for safety and stabilization, the threat of loss of integrity, right? Like something with a historic background, once you lose it, it's not replaceable. So we would do our best to make sure it keeps its integrity. Poor condition falls in the line with that. Um, and then 
potential impact due to enhancement. Um, so we wanna just make sure if things, <coughs> sorry, um, could have an impact that we have this basis and the treatment recommendations. And when it says critical path adjacencies to other planned work, that's um, where I'm talking about if there were projects adjacent to our property, let's say, I don't have a good example of a transportation project, perhaps that was, you know, or a utility project that was going through the project, we definitely have this information to share with them, um, just to start the conversation, they know it's available. And then we have those conversations, and then relevancy to other current plans. So just looking at all the other plans that we have in our system, we want to make sure they're aligned and working together. <clears throat> you can hit the next slide. Um, so Glen Henning Banshell, what you'll notice is that one is not actually posted online right now. We do have the draft ready, but because we're doing the cultural landscape assessment that is so directly related, we pulled it up, put it on pause just for a minute so we can finish that cultural landscape assessment and make sure all the language is well aligned. Um, and if any new documents arise, we can share it, but the HIP will still remain with the current boundary. Um, and so we did add the, um, the priorities here because even if a little bit, some of the words changed at, because of the outcome of the culture landscape assessment, the meat of what we've learned and the treatment recommendations inside there um, remain the same. So these priorities, and I'll just run through a few of them, right, is rehabilitation of the roof and floor. So um, whether it's weather or a high level of use, um, that's a consideration. And in your packet, there, it, there are more words to that. I just kind of made a synopsis of it here. Lighting and security, rewire bollards. Oh, there's a crack in the foundation. Um, we're looking at repair and potentially replace the seating if needed. But I think right now it's really just in a paint situation and then and review. Um, and then repair some of the sidewalks um, and some of the sandstone retaining wall. Now, I'm not gonna go through every one of these because they were in your packet. And um, I just wanted to highlight a few. So if Rosa, you wouldn't mind maybe going to like Harbeck House. So tap down, just next slide. Yeah, um, so this is another property that you're probably familiar with um, if you've been on the board for a couple of years. Um, right, some of the main things we need to do here is assess the structural in integrity of the chimney. So for example, if you're standing in the parking lot, you can actually see some deterioration. This plan didn't go to the level of actually getting someone up on the roof. So the recommendation is let's get someone up there and actually look at it and see what that, you know, if it, if it is a visual, if that needs to be fixed or if there is actually a structural. Um, window treatments are something that we're looking at. Um, partly working with the tenant, but partly wanting to make sure, even though only the exterior is, you know, let, let's say that the part that the landmark covers, we know that, you know, sun exposure to the wood floors and some of the interiors, um, it's in that preservation mode of wanting to make sure we keep them um, as prime as they are. Um, so we can go on from there. Um, before we go to, actually, if you want to go down Rosa to um, the next step slide. It's probably six down. Yep, one more, there you go. So what we were talking about basically is what we really focused on, what are the top priorities for each process or for each property? And then we want to prioritize those within each other and then within the greater system. Um, once we look at what that looks like in the capital project, we're going to put cost estimates together, develop those project plans, and then those can actually be inserted. And then you'll have timelines on some of those projects. Um, before I go on, do you have any questions? Questions from the board? Okay, next slide. Just, yeah. So basically the outcomes of these, right, as we know that they're gonna put into the capital investment strategy, we're also looking at, you know, what we can do this year um, and the and 24. Um, so right now, actually this is 
LAC application submitted landmark alteration certificate. Um, it's actually approved now, so we have the approval to um, do these in the next, well, with it by the end of 2023, let's say. Um, and so, I, you know, I think this is a really good example of that being proactive. Now that we have this list, it's really it's starting to get easier and easier to insert them into our process. So this just uh, kind of, to me, shows some action in the near term of how it is actually being used. In addition to these capital projects, we also have our list of maintenance projects, right? We know the things that we're, the small things that we're doing that are just regular maintenance um, that are just standard. So we, you know, that's not something we normally talk too much about with PrEP, right? It's just our, our regular operations and maintenance. Um, so we can go to the next step. Um, so these are really just the questions that were outlined. I did change, um, the order a little bit because I know we have Marcy um, and Christopher on the phone. Um, so this one is really about, do you have any questions about the sequencing of the project? So those three projects, you know, they all have slightly different timelines. They sort of fit into each other, um, but they are, they all also do have their own process. Questions from the board? Great. Um, Pretty clear. <laughs> how about any questions about the technical findings, like how we we formed those and the priorities? Yeah, could you go through the the details of how you did all the technical findings for each of those? If you would like, I I could. We'll we'll pull out the four hundred page document and we'll go page by page. No, um, it was it was fun. It's I mean it's nice, and so there really are several um, technical sub consultants. Um, that have a high level of expertise um, that we sat really in, and looked at those priorities one by one. And in some cases, we knew we had some things we wanted to move up. And in some cases, because they are the technical expert, they're like, no, this has to stay a priority. So, And number three, any questions about the prioritization or how that will inform the future capital funding? Thanks so much for your presentation. Well, thank you. Especially being under the weather. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, my pleasure to be here. Yeah. And I appreciate you all taking the time to, to listen and ask really good questions. Thank you. OK. Uh, Allie? Yeah, we are going to do a little shuffle here. Uh, we're going to have our business services team join me up here on the dais. Your next two items relate to financial matters. So we're having our financial team come on up. So just give us a moment. This is a good opportunity for a bio break. If anyone needs it, give us a minute or two to shuffle teammates and let's, we'll be ready to go in just a minute. Yeah. Let's take a three minute break from the Perfect. meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, I need your tax credit permit. 
they always think that they they hit the hard system now that they actually have to know in February or comments. Um, I don't know that the system is um, equitable, but I wish it was more accessible. It's a whole lot of costs. So because the reservoir is water storage, we we for 10 years they've had a we have had a policy that we don't allow these data to come to show up just in the planning process because we want people to have a permit and have gone through the application. But when that policy was developed, so that happened. I think the voting technology that exists today didn't exist. And so I would love for us to figure out a way that people can just show. I was at the Rev on Monday yeah. and we were there. We had two stand up paddles. Three young people showed up their SUPs. They get them out and out comes the lifeguard. Like, I need some permits on your water project. Sure, yeah. yeah. And so I agree. I think it's a barrier for a lot of people. Well, I don't know what the answer is, but we're trying to figure it out. The lake in one month is yeah. just show up for the parking space. And anywhere in the states, system. Same. Like okay. if you can go to Pearl Lake and Steamboat or Gross Reservoir just west of here. Um, Westminster doesn't allow any watercraft on Stanley Lake anymore because it's the sole water source for 400,000 people and they're conserving water. The species is so huge. If um, you also see where mussels are the species that is on Lake Powell, if they were to get into our lake, it would be billions of dollars a year in water infrastructure work to because you can't eradicate them so you have to yeah. constantly claim the intake filters and in the water infrastructure. So there's no easy answer, but I would love to figure it out. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm happy. Okay, is staff ready to go? We are, Mr. Chair. Okay, great. So tonight you all have an action item to approve our five-year capital improvement program. This is um, probably one of your most important jobs. We're really grateful for this conversation tonight. Um, presenting this item is our senior manager for business items, Jackson, or business services, business items, <laughs> business items. Uh, that's a good term for your unit. Uh, so Jackson Height is our senior manager for business services and joining, joining us on the dais is Stacey Hoffman. She is a senior budget analyst. We've got some really great people on our team and we'll let them take it from here. Perfect. Thanks for the introduction, Ellie. Um, we are going to dive right into CIP. Um, in your agenda packet, there are two different items, uh, but we are going to just run through them back to back. Uh, so first up is the public hearing related to the 2024 through 2029 CIP. Um, I'm sorry, I just want to clarify, you're going to do the CIP presentation and the operating budget. Can we check, Rosa, do we have anyone here for the public hearing for CIP? Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. Business items first. Um, so uh, you have seen the PRAB's role for budget development before. This is the um, shells as far as what you shall be doing. 
Um, any appropriation or expenditure from the Permanent Parks and Recreation Fund does require the PRAB's approval. So what we are looking for tonight is your approval of that, which will then go to the Planning Board and City Council. Um, and then the second aspect is when we get to the operating budget, uh, we are looking for the PRAB shall make recommendations to the Council concerning the um, proposed Parks and Recreation Annual Budget. Um, and then we do have the fee policy. This is being brought back to you tonight. Um, and then it will be an action item in the July meeting um, to continue forward with the process that we've been on. So um, I'm just going to remind you of the timeline as far as where we've been. Uh, we've been talking about budget and numbers with you since March. Um, in addition to the top half of the screen, which identifies the PRAB touch points, we have met with City Council at their May um, study session. We've met with the community connectors and residents to gather feedback from an equity perspective. And we've spent uh, probably hundreds of hours in staff meetings, meeting with our different programmers, uh, facility site supervisors, and senior manager staffs to get their input on the overall budget, um, both the operating and the uh, CIP budget. While this is probably the last touch where we are looking for your input on the budget, um, we still have six months left in the year to go through the budget process. So we actually have submitted um, all of our preliminary numbers to the executive budget team in the central finance um, department, and they are spending the next month reviewing uh, the work that has already been done. And then they will roll that up into the city manager's uh, recommended budget, which will be shared uh, no later than September 1st. In September, there is a study session focused on um, the budget process. And then in October, there will be two different public hearings to approve the budget with the 2024 budget actually going into effect on January 1st of 2024. So quite the marathon, we're about halfway through, but your role and involvement is nearly wrapped up. Um, that being said, we do plan to come back to you and report on what the status is, um, what changes are made through the recommendations of the executive budget team, the um, city manager's recommended budget, as well as planning board and city council. So finally diving into CIP. Um, as you know, uh, the CIP is a um, next year plus a five year outlook. So the CIP encompasses a total of six years. Uh, the first year is what's actually appropriated through the budget process, while as the remaining five years are kind of what is planned and accounted for. So back in the study session in April, uh, Mark shared with you kind of what the CIS uh, six-year plan looks like. And this is a cyclical process that we do typically go through every year um, to really identify what the big spend and project are or projects will be over the next uh, 18 to 24 months, but then also what is in our pipeline so we can start the community engagement, the funding, um, and the work planning associated with many of these large scale projects that take several years to complete. Um, so as a reminder, we do have the six year CIP, the two year work plan, and then the one year CIP. What we're asking you to approve tonight is really the one year CIP since that is the appropriation, but we are looking at it holistically with the overall six years um, of CIP funding. That's basically penciled in and uh, as we get to each year, we write it in Sharpie as far as what the numbers are based on cost escalations, scheduling, um, staff capacity, et cetera. So just as a reminder, the CIP was developed looking at the six key themes from the 2022 department plan. Um, I think that the every theme is relevant, but the one that we really focused on this year was taking care of what we have and financial sustainability. Um, as a reminder, both of these graphics were in the 2022 plan and everything in the fiscally constrained column is addressed at some point in the six year CIP. So we do want to highlight that we are really taking the plan um, and implementing it and using the recommendations from that plan to help us guide the next uh, six years of capital spending. As Mark had shared earlier um, this year, the updated work plan categories really fall into asset management, which is taking care of what we have, the parks and recreation facilities, which is where a majority of our funds are spent, and then the system planning. The system planning is looking a bit further ahead and more um, strategic in nature whereas the other two uh, categories are where we see the majority of our spend. So we're just going to hop right into the um, different categories. Um, as far as it relates to asset management, you will see we have several different asset categories based on the types of um, assets within our system. And in 2023, we really took some of the direction from the 2022 plan and started allocating out to different asset types. 
Um, while that was the first stab at it, uh, we didn't have a lot of information. And as we continue to gather information through Beehive um, and better cost estimating, we have updated the amount that we plan to spend in uh, the far right hand column, which is 2024. You will see that for the majority of these columns, they have increased in dollar amounts, um, just accounting for the reality as well as um, community input and feedback. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the courts has increased from $200,000 a year to $360,000 a year. Uh, we do have a few numbers in bold that have changed slightly uh, from the uh, agenda that was, or the proud packet that was shared with you last week. Um, we have just continued meeting with our colleagues in other departments and central finance, and this has resulted in some um, minor shifts that we just wanted to call out for your attention tonight. Can you tell us how those changed? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the historic property was left out. Um, that was actually under system planning um, at the $62,000. We have updated it here just as it relates more to asset management. Um, and then the zero in general maintenance, we just wanted to call out the fact that that um, $310,000 allocated in 2023 was actually in operating dollars. It wasn't in CIP. So you aren't seeing a significant decrease in CIP. It's just where the money is um, being tracked to spend out of. And then finally, in play areas, we had 200,000 allocated. And uh, all of that is going to North Boulder Park, which is on the next slide. Um, so you will see that in a park system plan. General maintenance, is that a, like, that's going to be zeroed out going forward and going to operations? or that I'm going to turn this over to Stacey. <laughs> Yeah, so good evening. Um, so general maintenance will not be zeroed out. We actually do have... Right, sure. So that will actually be seen on the next slide. Um, if you remember when we did the Scott Carpenter pool redevelopment, we also have to do the street area for about a million. So we had that programmed under general maintenance. We've called it out in a separate project for 2024. And then starting back in 2025, we do have general maintenance in the plan. I'll just pause. I'll pause here. Are there any other questions? Okay, so moving ahead to the parks and facilities, um, just given the overlap with where our planning team is at and the funding is at, we have included several 2023 projects that are um, shovel ready under construction or about to go through community engagement. Um, just as a reminder that these are in the work plan and we don't want you to feel as if they've been forgotten. Um, and then we also have projects that are new in 2024 or have some existing funding in 2023 for the design work, but we need additional funding in 2024 to actually complete the project. So these numbers are giving you more of what the total project cost is associated with it um, and really just wanted to highlight those. Once again, we have bolded two numbers on here that um, have shifted around since the um, prep packet was shared. Um, as Stacy had mentioned, the Violet Park plan was higher in the Proud Packet, and Scott Carpenter Park was omitted. Um, we have rectified that and do have funding set aside for both projects um, based on collaboration with our other departments. Um, I'm going to defer to Mark on this. I know that our portion of it was widening the 30th Street corridor um, for the bikeway and uh, the roadway, but Mark. Said it all. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Mark Davison, manager. The, um, yeah, it's the street improvements that we all agreed upon and this was Mark's portion of it. And it's also a bus stop bike path and uh, actually including a rain garden. Good project. Thank you for those questions and thank you for the specifics, Mark. So moving over to our system plans, um, we have several plans that are underway and once again just wanted to highlight the 2023 projects to let you know that these aren't lost. Um, in fact, I believe every one of these is currently um, assigned to a project manager and underway. And then in 2024, we do have a natural land system plan and then a nature play system plan. Um, you will see that system planning is the smallest portion of our overall CIP budget. 
um, just because uh, these plans really identify how we spend our asset management dollars, as well as our um, parks and facilities dollars. There weren't any changes to highlight here, um, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Yeah. We have a question. Um, the process for the park recreation activity survey activity survey is that the one that the community connectors were involved in gonna turn this over to mark yeah thanks uh, good question no that isn't related to that that's a separate project where they put on the cip uh we've had discussions where we don't technically at this point have we go into engagement and look at data in parks on particular projects but we don't have trend data for activities in parks and the types of recreation activities that occur, as well as the numbers of people visiting parks related to that. So this is to begin a process to begin basically counting the number of people in parks, identify the recreation activities, so we can better understand the needs and that better informs the types of facilities we have, and better informs our planning down the road. So this will start that off with the goal that that's a longitudinal study you know, typically they happen say every three years and over time then you can get better trend data to make decisions uh we're literally today we're working with nrpa we've met, got a contact there through ali to start looking at some of the national standards for how to do that we'll be in line with other communities the equity focus be brought into that to see who is doing what in Absolutely. We, we use that. Um, we have the equity instrument and we use that on every project we do to ensure nowadays that we cover all aspects of all equity. And that's a huge improvement by the city over the last few years. Thank you. Speaking of equity, um, part of the 2022 plan was looking at equity mapping throughout the city. Um, and this map really just highlights uh, the darker the colors in blues and purples, I'm going to say, um, means that there is the greater need for equity. And we've identified where various projects in the six year CIP plan are located. And you can see that there is a huge emphasis on equity for our various CIP projects we've highlighted. So in terms of dollar amounts, um, we do have the 2024 CIP by fund. As a reminder, this is what will actually get appropriated with the 2024 budget. Um, and because this is split across funds, we do have a variety of different funds. Um, the three funds that Parks and Recreation really has the greatest control over and considers part of our annual capital expenses are the 0.25 cent sales tax fund, the permanent Parks and Recreation fund, and the lottery fund. So you can see that those account for about two thirds of the budget. Um, we have several other capital funds that we'll use on an inter intermittent basis or project by project basis. And those are um, a variety of funds across the city that we did want to call out directly. So you will see that that accounts for about a third of the budget in 2024. And that's split across the Boulder Junction Fund, which mainly supports the uh, project at East Mapleton Ballfields. There's additional money set aside in the development impact fees um, and then CCRS for more of the design and scoping of the overall CCRS projects. Within the six year CIP, there is $41 million of capital proposed. Um, this is up from 34 million in the 2023 through 28 CIP. Um, so we are continuing to invest in our capital assets. Once again, you will see that uh, the three dedicated parks and recreation funds do account for the majority of the projects um, and spend. We have left off the CCRS projects on this slide um, just because we are going to talk about that a little bit more in detail. But the additional funding really comes from development impact fees, which will be going towards um, the park on Violet and Boulder Junction associated with the Boulder Junction Pocket Park, as well as the uh, East Mapleton Ball Fields. So collectively, this averages out to about $7 million a year. Um, in the 2022 plan, uh, we were spending, I believe, $5.6 million a year in CIP with the goal of getting to $7.5 million a year to basically meet the fiscally constrained environment. So we are making significant progress, but this still isn't fully funding um, our fiscally constrained vision. And uh, with that, we did want to provide you a breakdown as far as where the do dollars are going. So you will see that asset management accounts for almost 50% of our spend. 
Um, we believe that this really aligns with the 2022 plans, taking care of what we have theme and wanting to really maintain our existing assets in a good condition. And then the additional 47% um, is going to parks and recreation facilities. And then you can see there is a small sliver associated with system planning. Um, once again, that spend is smaller because it's really creating the plans that inform how we spend the remaining dollar amounts. As I mentioned earlier, CCRS was left out of um, everything except for the 2024 budget, just because this is a big ask and several um, high profile projects that are still going through the full vetting process. Um, you'll see that our ask is about $63 million for three projects listed here. There is the Boulder Creek Linear Park for about $12.5 million, um, which is the total project budget. And with that, we have already received $450,000 in 2023 and uh, are requesting an additional $500,000 in 2024. Um, as a reminder, Boulder Creek Linear Park really extends um, the entire backbone of the city east to west um, and creates greater accessibility to um, the creek, as well as improves the transit um, mobility options across the city. Reimagining Civic Area East um, has a total price tag of 41 million. Um, you'll see that there's about $750,000 requested for the design work. Um, and then future construction costs would be coming out of that 41 million. And then finally, the Pearl Street Mall refresh is about 9.7 million. Um, and that project wouldn't actually start until 2025, but we do have it included in the six year CIP, so I wanted to highlight it. These numbers do not include the um, cost for any recreation center refresh. Um, our facilities team is still working with uh, various consultants on our staff to understand what the total scope is and we'll have updated numbers to share um, as part of their budget request. I'm going to pause here. Are there any questions on CCRS projects? I have a question. Um, there we go. All right, the linear, um, the Boulder Creek Linear Park, is that just maintaining what we've already gotten or do you have a vision for doing more along that parkway? Mark, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's a good question. We currently are just writing what we call the charter, the sort of preliminary scoping. So we'll obviously be coming to Prab like we've done for like Civic Area Reimagination Project uh, in, a, in about six months time. We're looking at various things. The, First of all, we've got natural resources along the creek and then the water quality of the creek itself. So we're partnering with utilities, looking at what that looks like, what's condition, what is future desired condition, and how would we make improvements? And we can't do it all. There's a limited budget, so what would we prioritize? Then obviously then looking at recreation opportunities, taking in mind you've got a focus of the Boulder Creek path, and then we do have access to the creek. So there's things like how do we improve safety, how do we improve the recreation opportunities? How do we improve uh, equity of access to the area? So as we do the project, we'll sort of be flushing out that scope more, but it is quite diverse. And then obviously, again, with budget, we'll have to prioritize which areas we can take on first and which ones are in a later phase. Thank you. And I'm also curious as to why we don't see South Boulder Rec Center on there. We're looking in the next six years. East Boulder was simply the named CCRS project. Um, this really should be all of the three rec centers together. Um, we did not update this slide fully from last year, and I'm sorry for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, just as a reminder. Um, I'm sorry, I did also have a question. Um, and that's actually the same question as Sonny had, except I was wondering about Pearl Street. Um, is it sort of the same answer? We're doing initial scoping? Uh, yeah, uh, Pearl Street will be getting into the main scoping in 2024. There is the, uh, which, is it 50th anniversary? I've got to make sure I got the right date. In 2027, so we've got a drive to really get Pearl Street refreshed by that date, so we can celebrate the 50th anniversary. And that is really a focus on uh, capital maintenance enhancement, not so much new. Got it, okay, thank you. Okay, we have the list of um, under and unfunded projects. Uh, this is just as a reminder that, <clears throat> sorry, 
even with $41 million in the CIP budget, um, there are certain things that we just don't have the full fiscally constrained action or vision level funding that uh, would be desired to meet all of the community needs. So some of these relate to maintenance, enhancement, and then obviously new facilities such as Valmont South or Area 3. So we just wanted to make sure that you have this running list and are aware that um, these projects do not have the full funding that uh, would be recommended as called for in the 2022 plan. So with that, we have reviewed um, everything. We do have a, two suggested motions for you tonight um, related to the capital improvement program. The first is uh, recommending the expenditures from the Permanent Parks and Recreation Fund for City Council appropriation. And then the second is considering the entire 2024 through 2029 CIP. <clears throat> but we can pause and answer any questions uh, before we get there. Any questions, any additional questions? In the board i had a question on the increase <clears throat> of you know kind of unexpected increase in funding it looks like in the packet went from what 28 million to 36 million over that six-year period uh, so the things you highlighted the increases were those increases that changed as a result of these projections or like where did that money go in terms of the revenue or the expenses it looks like that's well for, as i read that it was it looked like additional revenue right Yes, so we have received updated projections in the 0.25 cent sales tax fund. Um, basically, when the 2023 revenue projections were established, we were still in a recovery phase from COVID. Um, those numbers have come in significantly stronger based on 2022 actuals and then the um, CU economists looking forward. The city has taken an approach to kind of go with a more moderate um, revenue projection rather than uh, conservative ones that they've been relying on the, for the past three years. So there is additional revenue there. Um, I don't want to paint anyone, but property taxes have um, gone up and the city is taking a rather conservative approach to what property tax increases will be just based on the different ballot initiatives that will be on the ballot in November. Um, but collectively, those two are the largest funding sources for how we have additional funding to allocate. So, so it's, but it hasn't been designated. Those additional funds haven't been designated. It's just anticipated. Okay. It's anticipated revenue. If you look at our fund financials, we do have um, additional revenue that exceeded expenses the past two years that we basically have some additional cash that we're sitting on um, waiting to put forward to these projects right now. Do you have a sense of how that'd be prioritized if once that's finalized? It really comes down to staff capacity and um, the prioritization. So I think that Mark and his team shared at the CIS as far as what their staff capacity is and priority projects. Um, so everything that's already identified as 2023 projects we're um, prioritizing before we get to 2024 projects. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Any additional questions? Anna? Uh, yes, I had a question going back to the previous slide about the underfunded projects. What is the amount that is required for funding like these? Mark, I'm going to... Actually, there's a there's sort of two answers to this, and one of them sounds a little bit bureaucratic, but it's the way we're at. The, basically, we're updating our asset management system. So when you see in the maintenance and then the enhancement, the reason I said it's bureaucratic is we've got a little process to go through to roll out our asset management program phase two. We got a little bit delayed with COVID. What that will do is give us you know current replacement values. Jackson mentioned earlier we're improving our cost estimating, and we're supposed to put two to four percent aside per year. Or maintenance but we know that will be a huge number once we get through that so we've got to be kind of realistic about what is poor condition what's fair condition how do we bring that up to par and what is it that we have to prioritize within the budget we've got so that's where most of that thinking will go in the maintenance enhancement and you'll be seeing because we're rolling it out this year the phase two of the asset management program over the next two touch bases with prab you'll see us providing more information with dashboards on where that funding's needed and where the, how we prioritize it. And then the projects themselves, when you look at sort of the, the new projects, we are still really like area three, we don't have a cost estimate for that yet. We do know, however, if we wanna do ballpark cost estimating, it's about 1.2 million for park development per acre on average nowadays. And we've done this by doing some benchmarking as well as looking at our own costs. And so if we're looking at area three and say we're developing 15 acres, 
or sort of intense park development, let's say, you might be coming in, you know, 15 to 20 million as a cost for that. So these are things we're working through to improve the cost estimating of that. But why are bathrooms and shelters not being funded at the level they need to be? It's in terms of yeah, we put in urgency of yeah, and needs. That's, that's the story in it, isn't it? We, we we initially were basically looking at bathrooms on a sort of a emergency or safety need basis. We've now actually got 125,000 per annum set aside for bathrooms. And what we're doing is we're spreading that, looking at the cost, it would be great to have, say, 300,000 a year. But when you look at the whole asset management system, that's as a percentage how much we can afford to invest in that and move them from, say, poor to fair condition or fair to good condition. So it's, it's proportional based upon the amount of budget we have. <clears throat> Any additional questions? Um, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. This could be a last question too. Sorry, I was just curious. You know, I think maybe two meetings ago, we we did the surveys where we kind of ranked priorities. And um, was that in fact how did, how was that used in all this process? If at all, I mean, if at all, just curious how that factored into this presentation. I think um, one of the messages that came through was what Dexon's pointed out, and I was taking care of what we have. So we definitely you've seen that there's a the asset management program has got more categories identified. So where previously like bathrooms didn't have funding, we've got funding now. And then things like courts have moved up by 200,000. The areas have moved up by um, from 200 to three, 300 to 800,000, to averaging out of 500,000 a year, it's about 300 million to develop. So I'd say that's where the main feedback we got from you. And then on the other side of things, there was the investment in some of the, like let's say Violet Park, the newer parks that are going in and having an equity focus on that. So I'd say that's where most of the information we got back to you was sort of used in this effort. Anybody else? <laughs> Don't go away. So I, I just have one comment on this. Um, I, I think it would, I understand the need to um, be efficient with slides and, and combine information, but I think that it might be more helpful to have um, to distinguish what is underfunded versus unfunded. That's I think that might actually alleviate some of the confusion because we're left to kind of guess which ones aren't getting enough money versus no money. Um, so I think that just as a comment, I think that would be helpful. Actually, that's an excellent process improvement. And uh, I think, as you know, we're, we're basically, our last cost estimating effort was sort of 2019. And there's been huge escalation since then. So part of it on our end is say, give us a chance to sort of update everything and get back to you. So yeah, that's something we can definitely do for next year and you'll see more detailed cost impacts. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your, Appreciate your transparency on this as well. Yeah. Okay, so can we go back to the, thank you. Um, is this the language you would recommend that we use? Yes, it is. Okay, um, so I would like to ask for Yes. This is a public hearing, Mr. Chair. I don't believe we have any members of the community, but we might want to pause and confirm real quick. Okay. I thought we had said earlier that I, were we no. did at the beginning, but we're supposed to, I think, I believe the procedure is still to open and close. Okay. We can grab the handbook to confirm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, okay, but just a second. So this is, so there's a public hearing portion of this for members of the public. If um, Rosa, are there any Anybody signed up to make public comment on this particular um, agenda item? Okay, so um, because there are no members of the public who've signed up for this um, public hearing portion of this agenda item, I'll close public comment. And now I will ask for a motion to for the item number one. Anybody want to move? It's written up there for you, Jason. You look like you're you're ready to go. I wasn't ready to go, but uh, <laughs> you're you're born ready. Read to read the motion now. Go ahead and do it. Yeah. Year four, I should know this. Uh, <laughs> motion uh, motion to approve the 2024 recommended expenditures, three million dollars from the permanent park and recreation fund to city council for appropriation. Second. Second. Any discussion? Okay, Rosa, um, would you mind calling the roll? Uh, 
Anita Spears. Yes. Andrew Bernstein. Yes. Elliot Hood. Yes. Anna Siegur. Yes. Jason Unger. Yes. Sunny Vanderstar. Yes. Uh, sounds like the motion passes. And we have a second motion to do. So we actually have to send our recommendation to council. So do I have a motion to do that? Anna, you want to give it a go? I motion to recommend the 2024 to 2029 Parks and Recreation Capital Improvement Plan to City Council and Planning Board. Second. I second. Rosa, can you call the roll? Oh, I'm sorry, discussion. I want to follow the Roberts rules here. Done? Okay. Rosa? Anita Spears. Yes. Andrew Bernstein. Yes. Elliot Hood. Yes. Anna Seeger. Yes. Jason Unger. Yes. Sunny Vanderstar. Yes. All right. The second motion passes. And that should close out this agenda item. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentations. Always, as always, well done. Thank you. So now we're going to shift gears onto the next agenda item. Um, we have the 2024 proposed budget and the fee policy. We have broken this out into two sections as they are slightly different. Um, once again, the same timeline applies that we had talked about earlier. So thank you for the efficiency of having these back to back. Um, with the 2024 budget, we did want to highlight what the key changes are. Um, we really didn't spend as much time going into the nuts and bolts of this year's budget. Um, just because there are so many things that we do on an ongoing basis that have incremental increases. We did highlight for you in the PREP packet um, the areas where we did see key changes, and I just wanted to call out the program growth. Um, some specific examples are, are um, the golf program, the gymnastics program. We'll continue to see continued growth based on our trends in those program areas, and as a result, we are increasing costs. Um, additionally, maintenance to support taking care of what we have. Um, we do have regular maintenance that gets embedded into our operating budget, such as the uh, cost to take care of our different park amenities um, and just the routine mowing, um, weeding, blowing of all of those areas. So we are seeing cost increases for basically just operations of um, our costs. Uh, new in this year's budget, we do highlight two ongoing transfers. Um, as you all know, the general fund subsidy to the recreation activity fund is expected to decrease. Um, and we took a look at all of our plans um, and different guidance that we've received over the last 15 years as we were updating the fee policy. Something that the city hasn't undertaken or the department, I should say, is aligning where the revenue and expenses for the sports field rentals are coming from. So uh, we receive revenue in the recreation activity fund, but the majority of the expenses come out of the 0.25 cent sales tax fund. So with 2024, we're proposing aligning that by bringing in all of the expenses for field maintenance um, into the recreation activity fund. Um, but given that there is such a substantial cost associated with that, we are looking at creating an ongoing transfer to pay for um, that overall cost. Um, and then over time, we will update fees to account for um, the cost recovery targets established by the fee policy. Additionally, we have a general fund contingent subsidy. Um, as we've seen, the um, recreation activity fund really does uh, provide a great deal of community benefit. The fund as a whole is very difficult to balance based on uh, perceived revenues and expenses, and it's something that we spend a whole lot of time with you on each year. Um, to basically lose $500,000 of general fund support overnight would have a significant impact. So what we are asking for is $250,000 of contingent subsidy in 2024 that would stair step down by $50,000 a year. This basically allows us time to implement the fee policy um, and continue to observe the recovery associated with recreation um, and the significant impacts that we've experienced over uh, the pandemic. You will see that our recreation center visitation is 
um, still below 2019 levels. And that's something that we're struggling with um, just because that is something that is required to balance in order to balance the fund. So our intention is the general fund contingent subsidy would only be relied upon um, if revenues don't uh, outpace expenses. Um, and we have that as something that would stair step down over time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, fee increases, we are still working on that policy with you and identifying um, exactly where we are going to see increases. But we have basically penciled in a 2.5% increase in fees um, each year over the next five years, um, with about $250,000 expected in 2024. Finally, on the staffing, um, we are requesting 16 FTE, uh, which br would bring the total department FTE up to about 160. Uh, three of these are tied to the Ranger program that is converting um, one-time FTE into ongoing FTE. And then we have a request in for 13 additional new FTE. Um, in addition to this, we did receive six and a half FTE um, in May of 2023 this year when the adjustment to base one was approved by city council. And these additional staff are across the department, but really in areas where we are continuing to see significant growth or uh, efficiencies in bringing on staff rather than relying on consultants. And then finally, um, you did see the CIP dollars and uh, this aligns with the capital investment strategy. So we are increasing the overall uh, budget associated with CIP. So those are the quick highlights. Um, I'm going to pause here and see if there's any questions. And I did want to call out in the memo, there is a reference to a navigation coordinator. That is something that uh, we had actually been back and forth about and was included in the memo by mistake. Our intention is to wait until the um, 2023 actuals come in and then request that position as an off cycle and or using grant funding, just because we do see there being such a great community need for this position um, that has a very compelling story behind it. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you for letting me catch my breath. Um, I know that some of us could sit here and look at spreadsheets all day. Uh, most of you probably love the visualization of this. So this graphic really visualizes how the department's budget has changed from 2019, which we really view as the last baseline year, um, going into 2024 budget. I will say that uh, looking at this long of a trend is kind of an um, anomaly for us, as well as finance professionals who typically only look back for three years. But given the impacts COVID had on our industry, um, the revenues within the city, we did think it was important to show you what a baseline year looked like. Uh, we do have general fund um, increasing. The 0.25 cent sales tax is tied to increases in sales tax activity. The recreation activity fund is tied to increases in programming. Um, and you'll see continued program growth compared to 2019. Permanent Parks and Recreation Fund has remained relatively stable, and you will see that that fluctuates year over year as some years we save up for larger dollar amounts um, and have less spend. Uh, but in 2019 was a year when we did both Scott Carpenter Pool and uh, the Boulder Reservoir that we did see a significant spend. So this is basically spending down funding that we've already collected. Lottery Fund stays relatively consistent. And then Capital Other um, are those one-time project-specific funds that uh, really vary throughout the six year history of the department. We do have all of this broken down between um, fund and how this compares to 2023. You will see overall, um, we are seeing about a $27 million increase across the board for uh, the typical um, capital funds. And then we did call out CCRS uh, differently just because there is uh, such a big ask associated with that 62 million that was discussed in the CIP. Um, but all of that factored in, we are looking at about a 25% increase compared to 2023's approved budget. Um, and once again, this is the department's request. It still has to go through further vetting with the executive budget team, finance department, city manager, um, before it gets included in the recommended budget. So new this year with the um, city's 
budget development process was the uh, finance department went to the community connectors and residents and gathered feedback on all of the city's services and citywide budget as far as what was important to them. Within uh, that feedback, we did hear that there are specific areas of interest from the community for parks and recreation. Um, and this includes the availability of safe gathering spaces and facilities, um, preventing and dismantling um, impacts of historically excluded community members, affordability and sustainability of financial assistance programs and accessibility through clear signage and multilingual support. So we did hear all of this feedback. Um, and in response to this, the department has shared with the community connectors and residents how our proposed 2024 budget aligns with this feedback, as well as um, any existing programs that are in place that we could share with those community members. So all of this was included as attachment B in your packet. Um, so you can see exactly what those services are that we are offering. And we're happy to discuss any of those in more depth if you have any questions. So with that, um, that really concludes our 2024 operating budget. Um, and I just wanted to pause here and see if you all have any questions on the 2024 operating budget. Questions from the board? Needing to pause my water breaks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're going to jump into the fee policy. Um, you will see that a lot of this content is very similar to what we've presented over the last few months. We just wanted to remind you as far as what the 2022 department plan policy shifts were. And basically with no new funding, um, the department needed to evaluate levels of service to identify um, where reductions could happen or pursue alternative funding um, to maintain existing levels of service. What we heard loud and clear is the community benefit programs are important to the community as well as this board. So there was a greater emphasis placed on finding additional revenue to continue to pay for those community benefit programs. With that, um, our intention is to establish a fee policy and then determine appropriate subsidy levels. Um, tonight in attachment A, you have the uh, draft fee policy, and this is something that we are looking for your feedback on. Um, and I'm not going to rehash all of it, but we have identified uh, 10 different program types. Um, some of those had existing policy, others without set policy, and then various levels of um, program benefit level from uh, community to exclusive. And I know that one of the areas of feedback is related to the word exclusive. Um, so very happy to uh, look into that word as we get further along. Um, just as a reminder, this was kind of the um, spectrum as far as where taxes went and where user fees went, um, as well as our cost recovery associated with the different types of programs. And once again, um, the community connectors and residents did have a special session focused just on the parks and recreation fee policy. This was held on June 9th, and um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Stacy to give the feedback as far as what was heard there and um, what we're trying to do about it. Yeah, sure, absolutely. You all hear me okay? Okay. Um, so we had gone to the community connectors and residents It had a very good turnout. Um, we kind of went over the similar slides that we just showed all of you and really um, posed the question to them, what impact, positive or negative, do you see the fee policy having in your community? And it was great open dialogue at that meeting. Um, we did receive a lot of good feedback. Um, and I would say it was really focused around uh, specifically about the fee policy and then also a lot about our financial assistance program that we do offer um, to the community. So in response um, for the fee policy, the, um, what we heard was that there was definite support for a fee policy um, and an understanding on why the department would be looking at a fee policy and then also increasing our fees to uh, sustain our programs, our costs, uh, staffing costs and everything that does align with that. Um, so we did hear support for that, but we also heard, which did um, support the PRABS feedback, the need to pursue additional funding and grants to maintain the community benefit subsidy. So um, 
the feedback was to increase subsidy to those in need to offset the higher costs. So certainly for the department not to decrease any subsidy levels, maintain those community benefit programming to the best that we could, and then really try to explore grant opportunities to help offset those costs. Uh, community connectors did uh, definitely volunteer and ask us to reach out to them if we needed any feedback for grant proposals, which we thought was great. Um, so there's just a lot of interest and involvement and connection there. Um, in regards to the financial aid program, that was really a top priority for them. Um, the feedback that we received is that they would love to see some increased communication and education surrounding the program. So how can we get the word out better? How can we explain what we're offering, what programs uh, could be supported by financial assistance? Um, also, they wanted to make sure that our forms could be simple to complete and the application process be as dignified as possible. So as a city, um, you know, how can we kind of streamline that process? If someone is applying for aid in another city department, how can that translate over to parks and recreation? How can we make a very quick and easy and comfortable process um, for our uh, community members? And then also pursue cooperative agreements with Boulder Valley School District um, in just working with the district, as many of you may or may not know, um, they will be going to a free lunch program next year. There used to be a letter, for an example, that would put you on a free or reduced lunch, which you could then use for um, financial assistance. Can we work with the district and see if something can be in replace of that just to keep it easy for them to keep applying for it? Um, so really just you know, feedback, making sure that that financial aid is sustained uh, for community members and um, you know, very passionate um, about the work that we're doing, very complimentary of parks and recreation. And um, you know, overall, I think it was a wonderful feedback session and great to have that opportunity to look at that from an equity lens. Thank you, Stacey. Mm -hmm. Um, so in attachment B, you do have the draft uh, fee policy. It's really, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's really broken down into five different sections. We have the purpose, the background, the definitions, the policy and the procedure. Um, this is your chance to really provide us any critical feedback that you have so we can incorporate it before we bring it back to you. Um, we have taken all of the feedback that we've heard at the various touch points with CRAB, um, which have been four different sessions, um, city councils, study session on May 11th, the community connectors and residents on June 9th, and then we have had multiple touch points with staff and have another meeting set up uh, later this week to review the uh, fee policy before it comes back to you next month. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we have done so much work already. Uh, Q1 and Q2 is very much complete at this point. Um, when we bring it back in July, the intention is to get uh, PRAB's approval on the fee policy to forward to city council. And that would be included as part of their uh, budget process is approving the fee policy. In the meantime, we do have significant work to be done um, to understand what our current cost recovery is by program area, and then align um, our cost recovery, uh, or align our fees to hit those cost recovery targets um, where necessary. So our intention is to start making um, recommended adjustments to fees that we would bring back to you to highlight where the fee adjustments are occurring. And as we've stated since the beginning, anything that is a community or recreation program, um, we would not increase fees by more than 10% in a year, just to make sure that those programs continue to be affordable. Um, our intention would be to start phasing in any new fees on January 1st, but there will be significant uh, community engagement that goes into that. So impacted users and user groups are aware of those fee increases and can start factoring those into their expenses. So with that, um, I know that you all have had a chance to review the fee policy. Um, this is the opportunity for you to provide any additional input that we haven't captured um, to make sure that your voice is heard prior to next month. Questions from the board? Jason? Um, I, have a, I have a question on the, it's a, towards the end of that attachment, um, you know, where there's the chart and, you know, community benefit, recreation, exclusive, you know, it looks like the percentages are consistent with community and with exclusive, but 
some of the recreation, there's one that's 70%, one it's 50%. Like how did you all determine that subsidy level? This was really based on the feedback that Prab had provided. You had that exercise where you kind of ranked on the spectrum um, where you thought everything would fall. And then we also did just a quick snapshot as far as what our current cost recovery was um, to gauge, are we ballpark close with where we think we should be? Um, at the end of the day, we do need to try to balance the overall budget as much as we'd love to subsidize everything. Um, we are trying to make sure that we can continue offering all of the programs that we do offer. Any additional feedback questions? Um, our chair, Chuck Brock, um, his feedback was, and I, I wanna echo some of this, is I like the fee policy. I would suggest an appendix with examples of the classification of community recreation and exclusive benefit. The appendix could give an example or two of each and then explain why they were placed in the category they ended up in. Um, he also raises the issue of the use of the word exclusive versus something else like individual, but that he's neutral on that. Um, and I would just echo Chuck's comment about the appendix. Um, I think that might be helpful. Thank you, very much understood. And um, we had heard the exclusive versus individual aspect um, and that wasn't changed in time, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can see um, how you would want to stick with exclusive, but I could also see some benefit to individual. So um, I had an additional comment, which was um, do or question comment. Do we have a fee schedule that we attach or that's readily accessible to where the fee policy lives? Great question. Um, current answer is partially for our recreation facilities we do list out what the daily, monthly, annual punch pass rates are. For all of our other fees, they currently live in the guide. Um, we have over 3,200 fees right now. Mm -hmm. The intention of this is later this year, we want to come back to you with that fee schedule and simplify what are these 300 fees that we've narrowed it down to, um, to be able to share with you and the public um, and have it fronting on our website as far as what is a fee to rent a rec center for one hour. Yep. That's great. That's Coming great. Back to you. Awesome. I really think that would be of great benefit to the public. And for me personally, I would love to have that printed out. <laughs> um, any other comments, questions? Okay. So um, there's no action item on this, correct? Um, that is correct. Okay. Um, we did not include this as a public hearing for the action item with the it doesn't for the operating budget it doesn't need a public hearing because you're not taking formal mm -hmm. action you're passing along a recommendation to council but i just to clarify action on the fee policy no the intention was and this is always when we bring you something for approval we want a clean read we don't want to be make we approve the fee policy with this amendment right so that's not the the goal tonight really was to forage for your input and improvements so that we bring in back in July, you're like, yes, this is what we said, two thumbs up. Or we would say, hey, we heard you on this thing. We did some analysis on it. Here's our response and here's the fee policy. So the intent really is to, to get, if, if you have any questions or feedback, please do share them now. Um, don't be shy so that we can bring back a clean read in July. Um, so I just wanna make sure I'm clear. If we don't have an action item, we do have an action item on the budget. The f it says action item. Yeah, it's not a roll call vote. I'm okay. sorry. It's just, it's a, it, a, a recommendation. So not a public hearing, not a roll call vote, but we would like you to- Someone's got to move for us to recommend to council. This is our budget. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any recommended language? Oh, you have any questions? Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, so if there's a group that doesn't agree with the designation, is there an outline process by which they can appeal like that they could present data on how many low income people they serve or how many dollars they gave out in scholarships or English language learners that are in their members? Like, is there some like vulnerability statistics that they can share about their programming? As we were doing our research with other fee policies, we saw that there wasn't an appeal process identified in most other policies. 
that is more of a staff administrative process as far as how to identify an appeal. Um, so we did not include an appeal section in the policy. Um, I think that that is something that we still need to clarify on exactly what the appeal would be um, and what it is that we're looking for. We do have several tools in place currently that um, really help with that, uh, that we would probably rely on updating those. Um, anything else to? Well, I would just add it. So here's, here's my dream world. My dream world is it costs us $100 an hour to maintain a soccer field. Community here is our rental rate. It is $100 an hour. You want a discount on that? Great. Show us data on how you're serving the community through scholarshiping, through alternate language program, and that's how you achieve discounted access and subsidy. And so I think um, because for our own programming, we go through, you've heard us talk about the recreation priority index. And so for community-based programming, what I think is an ideal state is this is the rate and everybody has that rate. You, you, we create a process by which people can um, lobby for discounting, right? By showing community benefits. So that's where I would love to be rather than us assigning people just, we don't have, you know, we, when we've worked on this for space allocation, we've had a similar process. We've tried to allocate pool time based on community benefit, even just by residency. We don't have that, that data. And so we've had to create a form that the user groups fill out to tell us who they're serving and how they are. So I think that's the ideal state. That would be the next level maturation in this process. Additional question, comments? Jason? Just on that on that point, I think we talked about this maybe at the, our study session on this, but it wouldn't just be kind of arbitrary, like here's your, here's, here's our justification, obviously with a clear kind of these are the things we look for, here's the potential discount, not kind of one group gets, you guys get a 20% because you're doing this, you guys get a 30% based on. Yeah. Jason, I've served this community for almost 20 years, more than 20 years now, I guess. Um, arbitrary doesn't work here. And and we try to not do it never. I wasn't accused. <laughs> no, I know. I just I agree. It, the intent is across, here's sure it's, no. I agree because I think some of the questions we get from user groups or rowers is it's not clear. It's not transparent. It feels like we're in some back room making up fees every year and just tossing them out. And so the the hope is that everything is transparent, consistent understandable doesn't mean everyone's going to support it right i want to be clear that is not the goal it's not that every you know every user group comes to us in january and says yay you increased our fees we we you know we we're excited um but the process the methodology it's consistent understandable and, and people get it well my specific point was like the process and methodology for for discounts is clear Correct. i think that's like even yeah. more important because you know then it could be arbitrary yeah um I agree. And then just on that, what is, what is, I'm sure we'll get to this at some point, what is the, you know, I'm sure there'll be a long kind of public process and how this is sold and justification and the benefits of this, like what is, is there kind of communication or outreach plan around this rollout? Jackson, if you want to go back to the timeline slide, but I want to be clear that the public process for the development of this is done. It happened during the engagement of the last two years for the development of the 2022 plan. Well, as far as the rollout of final recommendations, like the Right. Oh, God. So the final, all of that is going to be through the PRAB conversations in the fourth quarter and then our communication with user groups. Okay. Is that, is that your question? Yeah. And more just, you know, anticipating, I mean, this has come up in, you know, lots of different ways, you know, you all know this, but us and just kind of getting ahead of this, as far as being, you know, clear about what this policy is, you know, the benefits, like why we've, mm -hmm. why the department has done that. And so more than, it seems like more than just PRAB outreach, but, and, you know, user groups, but just kind of a general communication strategy around this before people get upset? Um, a general communication, I, I, I don't want to promise people won't be upset. Uh, what, I, what I will hope for, and I guess I'll, I'm looking to Jackson and to Scott, I do think a communication strategy around general community engagement. We have a fall guide, right, where we know we can reach 45,000 community members that we can talk about, hey, you know, people have been talking about this, this is going to be implementing. I also want to just call out, I mean, I'm trying to right size expectations. We're going to do everything we can to not have upset people, right? We're going to cap increases for community benefit and recreation programs. We don't want to have, you know, 50% increases. That's not, that's not fair to, to people trying to recreate. We want people to move. So we'll stagger increases. We'll do general community rollout. I do think though, some targeted focused meetings with user groups is actually where we can be most effective because they, that will then shape how they communicate with their 
um, their constituents. And so I, I think a, a like thoughtful who we talk to when and how is a great idea. Okay. I mean, there's nothing you all do that's not thoughtful and well, but more just kind of wanting to flag that, that, you know, making sure there's more than just, you know, prab and user groups there. So thanks. Any other questions or comments? Um, I would just add that, uh, you know, we've definitely gotten a lot of comments from some user groups who are upset with their categorization and we've um, provided a forum for them to explain um, their differences of opinion and their thoughts on the fee policy. Um, and I just would encourage staff to continue to provide open um, uh, channels of uh, feedback for those contracts that we're establishing with them and the fees and to ensure that we continue to have transparency about fee increases, which it seems like you all are obviously thinking about, but just as we transition into the next year as well. So thank you. Um, okay, so we were about to move. We did not get through that. So do I have a motion and what, is there any language you would like us to use? I'm sorry, I don't have language on here. I mean, we can wing it. Do you want me to pull up last year's? No, just pull up the, sorry, pull up the CIP motion for the five-year plan. So if you look at motion number two, and it's just the, instead of, the 2024 Parks and Recreation CIP to Planning Board and City Council. It's simply motion to recommend the 2024 Parks and Recreation operating budget to City Council for approval. Okay. Um, and it does not go to Planning Board. So. Anybody want a motion? Sonny, you want to go for it? <laughs> it's like an ad lib. <laughs> yeah. Operation. <laughs> ad lib. Okay. Motion to recommend. Motion to recommend the 2024 operation budget um, to, to city council for approval and appropriation. Thank you. Good job. Uh, any second? I'll second that. Thank you. Um, okay, any discussion? Okay, uh, let's call for a vote, Jason. Yes. Sorry, yes. Yes. Bernie? Yes. Anna? Yes. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Is it need a, on the line still? Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes that's my answer, thank you. Sorry, Anita, for skipping you. Okay, the motion passes. Okay, uh, the next, so that completes our matters for discussion uh, and the action items. I think the next item is the matters from the board. Is that right? Because we switched the two matters for discussion. I think it should be matters from the board. That's correct. Okay. So we have three matters from the board. Um, one is the discussion of the PRAB handbook revisions, which I can provide. Um, and then we have a continued discussion on the board liaisons to the BPR projects. And then um, we have PRAB matters. And um, I'll just start with the PRAB handbook revisions. So we're getting um, close to the end with that. Uh, I submitted the draft of the handbook revisions to the city attorney's office and the city attorney's office was able to provide very helpful feedback on that. And um, uh, it is my hope that we can incorporate the comments and changes or recommended changes from the city attorney's office uh, into the draft that we can then present to you um, at the next meeting for review. And so just like a, as is typical in this type of review, this won't, the next meeting won't be the approval of the handbook revisions. It'll just be the first reading 
of the handbook revisions. And then we'll take the feedback from that, if any, and we'll incorporate them into a change. And then we'll have a second reading. Um, depending on how much feedback we get, the second reading might be good enough. If we need a third reading, we can do that. But um, uh, we're only a couple of months now, probably away from having um, a brand new shiny uh, handbook that will be uh, great. So um, thanks for everybody's feedback on that and for your patience as we get that done. Any questions or comments about that? Thanks for taking that on. Sure, yeah. my pleasure. Okay, so continued discussion on the board liaisons to BPR projects. So I wasn't in attendance at the last meeting, but my understanding is that we continue to have discussion on and had a more thorough discussion on um, liaisons to BPR projects. And uh, my understanding of what we want to address today is kind of twofold. One is we've got two vacancies still. Uh, we have nobody assigned to the court's system plan, and we have nobody assigned to the BPR fee policy um, discussion. And we have multiple opportunities that have two people assigned to them. And two is not two is great, but not necessary um, for these. And so it would be great if we could discuss either reshuffling the, um, the matches or who's designated to be the liaison, um, or if we could get people to sign up for these two vacant ones. And so I'll open up for discussion on that. Well, despite what I said earlier, if I'm happy to uh, take on one of the ones that doesn't currently have anyone assigned, mm -hmm. um, I can't say that I know anything about tennis or pickleball, but um, <laughs> I'm willing to learn. That sounds like perfect. Okay, for this. all right. So put me in. Put me on the court plan. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask good questions. I, I will. Okay. So any, um, I mean any opposition, any discussion about Bernie being our designated liaison to the court systems plan? Okay, good, all right. <laughs> Bernie, I'm penciling you in, my friend. Okay, and then we've got the BPR fee policy also has no takers. Chuck would love that. Chuck would be all over that for sure. If he was, what did he say? He said, um, Chuck had actually a comment. I want to make sure we communicate. Um, oh yeah. He wanted to be considered as a board member to the play play Boulder foundation and definitely wants to be a liaison for the Violet park development, which I don't see. Um, he's on there. Is he? Mm -hmm. He is on there. No. Oh yeah. Liaison. Okay. So he does. He did not raise his hand for the fee policy. So oh, I'll just open it up for discussion on the fee policy. We've got a blank space here. Chuck is not here, so I don't want to volunteer him for something he hasn't said he wants to do. Although I think he would be really good for the fee policy discussion. Mr. Chair, would it help if I just reminded everyone from May what the what we're looking for with the liaison role? Yeah, that'd be great. It's. One input on process and community engagement. So we're all buried in this all day long and your questions about engagement and how we're talking to people are super helpful to us. Second, um, to have a deeper level of knowledge, not expertise on a project so that when it comes before the board, you can help create connections there also. And then finally, just supporting the board conversations on the topic at the business meetings and study sessions. So it does not require expertise in any one topic. Hopefully that's what our team is bringing to the table, but really you're a community expert. Any additional, any takers? Um, just, just in, in Bernie's defense, I would, it seems like the rec centers are a big enough topic that we, if we could have two people on that one, if you want, if you still want to do it, I don't want to assign you to, I mean, I'm, I am very interested in that. Um, I mean, it's such a huge issue. Yeah. Well, Ali, do you have a sense of how much additional time each of these projects will require? Five hours a month. No, I'm just kidding. 
Um, that's a, that's a really good question. When as we talked about this, I would expect it's it's an hour to two, a quarter, and it really depends. So, like Rec Center's future, we're on hold now while our partners in finance and facilities go out to the market to test these different funding models. Um, but for each of these, you can see we've tried to scope out the quarters. I would anticipate it's an additional hour or two of your time a quarter. Okay, well, I'm happy to stay at the rec center project, but somebody else has to do fees. Yep. So I'm happy to step up and take the fees. And, and I'll also note, I mean, we just had a significant conversation about the fee policy. Um, what I anticipate the engagement on that one is through Q2 of 2024 is as we start looking at current costing and, and where we are with cost recovery, with where we think we might need to be, we're going to be identifying next steps and implementing that. But um, it, it's not a heavy lift. And if there isn't a board liaison to that one, it's probably because we're almost fully um, complete here. It, it's not awful. So. Um. I want to make sure we give Anita a chance to weigh in if she has any comments or suggestions. Not right now. Not right now. Thank you. Sure. So um, as I said, I'm happy to step up and do the fee policy liaison role in addition to the Boulder Junction liaison role. And yeah, I will just say, given based on my experience with the Boulder Junction, um, group it's fairly minimal in terms of time commitment and i think we've had one meeting so far and there's another one coming up in july and um you know it's a couple of hours a month maybe of extra time if if not less so just on the, on the civic area it looks like i'm on up here a few times but i'm happy to give that to chuck if I think he's waiting. He's holding out for the Violet Park. Is there? Yeah. yeah. Is there? It, yeah, because he's got that. Chuck's got the Violet Park one. He's already on the Civic Area one as well. My recommendation would just be to keep him as a maybe on there, just because he's not here. But that's just my recommendation. Any. Anybody have any comments on that? Okay. Okay. So I think we've got our two uh, vacancies filled. We've got the we've got Bernie for the court systems plan, and we've got me for the BPR fee policy. Bernie is committed to the recreation center center's future. Anything else I'm missing, Allie? No, I think you all covered it. And I just, I want to appreciate your time. Really the intent with these liaison roles is that when conversations come to you, we've done an even better job with community engagement and process. So thank you. Yeah. And then um, moving on, the last item for Matters on the Board is uh, Prad Matters, which is just a chance for us to share um, activities that we've done or participated in that relate to um, the department's work or just, you know, thoughts from the community about BPR's work. Um, it's kind of an open, open mic at this point. Anybody want to share? Sunny? Um, I was really sad to miss Roller Palooza. My mother-in-law flew in from the Netherlands and was just not adjusted for something that incredibly fun. So we did not go, but um, I love the idea. And I just want to shout out to summer camps. Um, my kids have been doing, um, they, they got to do growing gardens last week, the farm to fork. They have been making smoothies and garlic knots and um, just really enjoying the benefits of that experience on the farm last week. And my son is um, doing the reservoir camp this week and just came home exhausted and happy. So um, great job with those camps. And I've heard lots of great things from other people too. So. Anybody else? Um, I'll just add that, um, really excited about the golf course facility 
and getting to participate in that was really fabulous. And um, I know that everybody in the community is excited about that, that I've spoken to. Um, and uh, it just seems like a really, really great place to direct our, our, uh, our attention and our, our funds. And I think it'll greatly increase the quality of the experience for not just people who play golf, but um, people in the community, as well as family members of people who use that facility. I mean, I think it will truly make it a more region. It will enhance the, the, the regional feel and reach of that facility. And I'm very, really, I'm very excited about it being finished. So well done on that. Anita, did you have something you wanted to share? Yes, I wanted to add that my daughter also went to the sailing camp today, but she was not tired, so she's still awake. Um, but it has been a great experience. She has also been um, playing tennis four times a week or so, and we keep running into the issue that there are adults playing as well, either um, tennis or uh, pickleball. And they keep cursing. And I just don't think that, you know, my daughter should be listening to those um, strong words. And I was wondering if maybe we can put up some signs or, you know, what else can we do when people are not being respectful? So, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Do you want to respond to that as staff? I can do that. Anna, were you going to add on that or did you have a different comment? Yeah. Um, I, Anita, I'd love to talk to you offline about that and just learn a little bit more about when, how often, and, and see um, if we can, well, there's a lot of different options there. So perhaps you can email or call and we can talk more. Anna? Sure. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that we have been to the Scott Carpenter pool a couple of times so far this summer. And I think the, like previously when in previous years, I think it was probably during the pandemic, um, the, the, the pool with the laps was kind of off limits for kids to play in because they just had lap swimming all the time. And I see a lot of the older kids are like, they've opened up, there's more availability for the, to use that pool now. And I think that balance is in a better place. Cause I, I see a lot of older kids playing in that area and, like I've counted and compared how many people are swimming laps, how many are people using that area. So I think opening that up was a great decision for bringing those kids. It's because Spruce Pool is open that, you know, we, um, there's less demand on the lane lines at Scotty, which means that we can open. I think they've got four to six open of the 20 a day for just open swim, uh -huh. which relieves one. It's great because it gives older kids something to do, but it relieves pressure on the rest of the amenities. It's amazing. And it's possible because the team got spruce open. We have enough staff it's working. So it's huge. It's a big win. Yeah. <laughs> and I would just add on to that. Um, I don't think we've truly given you guys enough credit. I mean, that Last the change between this year and last year with lifeguard coverage and facility availability is really great, and um, you all should be commended for achieving a really important win on staffing our pools and making sure that we the community can use our facilities. Uh, I am looking to my left because Scott joined our team at the end of November last year. And from the day he started, we said, you have one focus. Our, our teams need help recruiting. They need help. Um, and he's led a, a staff team. We have a, a last, last year, you heard us talk about Aqua Force, which was the team we had where we were allocating resources. It, this year it's called Summer Squad because really we know we need staffing across the department in camps, in the pools and in park maintenance. And we have more people on our team this summer than we have ever had. Um, part of that it's because it takes 9 million people an hour to operate Scott Carpenter mm -hmm. Pool, which we didn't have before. But um, They've done such incredible work, and I'm so grateful for Scott's leadership in that work. And what's even cool, and I think just so um, illustrative of the type of people on our team, is that they already have a work plan for the fall of things that they, you know, in May, we had a nice lunch, we celebrated, they said, now we're going to put our heads down and, and provide great experiences all summer. But they have a work plan for the fall of things they want to build so that they have a really solid foundation for next year. We're going to do a job fair in August because all of these children that are working for us, these students that are working for us right now are going to go back to school. Um, and so we know that, that we're not done and we've got to keep going, but they have done an incredible job. I agree. And I'm really grateful. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, and then I had one other question just to follow up with Scott. Um, I know you had said you were going to have a meeting with the superintendent of BBSD about the financial aid. Now, just wondering if that happened and what the update was. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, yes, Scott Schuttenberg, deputy director. Um, Ali and I actually both got to meet with um, Dr. Anderson. We had a wonderful conversation. And this Thursday, I'll be meeting with their um, marketing and communications um, specialist with the school district. So I'm excited because Dr. Anderson was very receptive about ways we can communicate and break down some of the barriers that students and families are facing. Um, what I did find out, though, is that um, the reduced lunch and free lunch letters that go out to the students really wasn't a big factor um, in determining financial um, eligibility for financial aid with us. Um, we have other avenues of determining whether or not individuals qualify. Um, but I feel really, really good about the meeting with Dr. Anderson and the relationship and the future of how our department and the city as a whole can work with the school district. Ali, anything you want to expand on with that? Yeah, so good things happening, right? Great, great um, connection. So thank you for the introduction. And uh, it was great to, uh, to sit down and have the conversation. And uh, one of the exciting things that I'm really looking forward to is we know we want to make data-driven decisions. And um, Dr. Anderson did share that um, he's open to the conversation about sharing some data, um, which is really impactful um, for us and can, can help us with grant opportunities and some other things and showing how our programs make a difference for students and their um, success in the classroom uh, with participation in our program. So, more to come with the school district, but really exciting. So thank you. Yay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, that is the last item on the agenda. Our next meeting is 6 p.m. on July 24th. And if there's no objection, we will adjourn the meeting. Okay. Adjourned. Thank you.